This is BBC Radio 4. And now Penelope Keith stars in our afternoon play. After a lifetime in public relations, Agatha Raisin is about to fulfil her dream of retiring to a cottage in the Cotswolds. We join her leaving party in London. Oh, quick, quick, she's coming. Oh, hide the flowers. The banner is in straight. It's a leaving do, not the Sistine Chapel. Is everyone ready? Shh, shh, shh. Aggie, two, three, four. For she's a jolly good fella. 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 Yes, thank you. Enough. And so say all of us. Enough, please. I do have a train to catch. Speak, speak, speak come on. Speak. Don't be shy. Oh, oh, dear. It is the end of an era, really. Uh, Mr. Pedman tells me you'll all keep your old jobs. Of course, you'll be Pedman promotions, not Raisin promotions. Shame. Thank you, Roy. And uh, I wish you all good luck. As politicians get grubbier and pop stars tackier, your lies will have to be even bigger. But never forget the lady who taught you all to lie so beautifully. Agatha Raisin. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> Mrs. Raisin, I've got you a present. Oh, Lucy, you really shouldn't have. It's a photo frame. Yes, I guess that. I have seen one before. I just thought you're at an age where your memories must be very precious to you. Thank you, Lucy. I must buy you a diary. One day you can get a life to put in it. Oh, Aggie, sweetie, we're going to miss you. Roy, it's the Cotswolds, not Timbuktu. You can still visit. (laughs) Got you a present. Why does everybody want to be nice to me now that I'm going? Well, I couldn't get you a gold watch. I didn't want to remind you of your advancing years, so I've got you... A gold cigarette lighter. Thank you, Roy. Mm. Every time I light up, I shall think of you. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Morning. 20 Benson and Hedges, please. Oh, good morning to you, too. Sorry, I have just spent half an hour behind a tractor that was going at five miles an hour. Five miles an hour. Must be in a hurry. Here, four ninety nine, please. Uh, do you by any chance have a list of um, village activities? Well... Well, there's line dancing in the village hall on Wednesdays. Yes, there probably is, but I mean evening classes, oh, societies. Let me have a look. Oh, you're in luck. You've come just the right time for the biggest event of the year, the Carsley Village Baking Competition. A baking competition? That's right. Who can bake the best cakes, the best pies, look, the best quiches. And that's the highlight of the year, is it? Well, thank you for the cigarettes. Just out of interest, this baking competition, who's the judge? Oh, Reginald Cummins Brown. He lives next door to you. You like him? He's an incomer too. Oh, really? How long has he lived here? Twenty-five years. Vera! Ah, hello, old thing. It's only me. Reg, who was that woman you were talking to? Oh, oh, that's our new neighbour, Mrs Raisin, a huge PR lady in London, so she kept telling me. I know the type. Hair that comes from a bottle and a mobile phone. She'll rip down the honeysuckle and she'll stick up a satellite dish. She seems a decent enough sort, asking me about the baking competition. Oh, I get the picture. She waltzes into this village and wants to take it over. She wants to run the place. Well, she won't succeed. We don't need that type around here. If you say so, dear. Evening, just after seven. Now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for Front Row. Francine Stock looks back. Hello. Hi, Aggie. Roy. How's the Cotswolds? Been chased round the barn by any horny farmers? I've only been here a week. I haven't gone native. Well, you know what you said about how I could come and visit? Yes. Well, can I come and visit? Uh, you can come next weekend on one condition. What's that, then? Bring me a quiche from Economides Quichery in the King's Road. Don't they have any quiches in the countryside? They do, but I am entering a baking competition, and I want to make sure my quiche wins. Um, 
Aguilab, I may be missing the point here, but if it's a competition, aren't you meant to bake it yourself? Roy, country people make things and grow things. City people pay other people to make things and grow things. Now, I am entering this competition, but I am obtaining my quiche the London way. <laughs> oh, Aggie, PR lost its number one star when you retired. <sighs> Oh, smell that country air. It's much fresher than London. I know. I'm having to smoke an extra ten a day just to compensate. Now, uh, over there, that is Vera Cummings Brown. Her husband's judging this. Oh, the legendary Vera. Yes,、mm. the woman who spent two weeks avoiding eye contact with me. Give me the quiche. Here you go.、Uh, Mrs. <clears throat> Cummings Brown. Yes. A quiche for your competition. Oh, well, don't give it to me. I don't want grease on my fingers. Put it down there. Now, I need your details. Name? Agatha Raisin. I live next door to you. Oh. Oh, so you do. I'm the one you stare at through your neck curtains. Oh, jolly dee. And your friend? This is Roy Silver. Hello. Oh, an assistant at my PR company in London. And did you make the quiche, Roy? Oh, not me. No. Oh. You look like the sort that might make quiche. Right. Put this label on your dish and take it into the tent down there. Judging is at three o'clock sharp. So, that's Vera next door, eh? Does she live in a thatched cottage? Yes. Why? Just wondered if I could set fire to it. I'll lend you my lighter.、Uh, excuse me. Is this where we put the quiche? Uh. Oh, that's right, miss. Ooh. Made that pie yourself, did you? Of course I did. Oh, <laughs> you ain't looking for a new husband, are you? Been there, done that. Never again. Wow. Good luck, Miss. You'll need it. If Cummings Brown is the judge, my money's on Nancy Cartwright. Really?、Mm. Well, we'll see. I think the village might be in for a shock this year. Nice talking to you. Right on. <laughs> you pulled there, Aggie. Don't be ridiculous, Roy. Right, I'm off to win some anchovies.、Uh, keep your voice down and pretend to be normal. Special commendation for her superlative elderflower wine. And now, the prize for this year's peace competition. The overall standard was very high and does you all great credit. Oh, for God's sake, get on with it! But there can only be one winner, and she is Nancy Cartwright.、Oh. What for that pile of scrambled eggs? Aggie, shush! Oh, thank you, Ray. Thank you ever so much. And here is your prize: ten pounds. Ten pounds? How's she going to celebrate? Crack open a bottle of Liebfrau milk, <laughs> Mrs. Raisin. We do not have the facilities to retain unsuccessful entries. What would you like us to do with your quiche? I neither know nor care.、Oh, there's no need to be quite such a sore loser. Well, waste not, want not. I'll take this home. Reg can have it for supper. I'm going out tonight. Fine. I hope his stomach can retain unsuccessful entries. Don't start. Come on. Hello, Mrs. Raisin. Cooey, Mrs. Raisin. Who the hell is? <sighs> oh, we meet at last.、Uh, my name is、uh, Mrs. Bloxby.、Uh, My husband is the vicar here, and we were just saying we must invite our new neighbour round for toasted tea cakes. I'm on a diet. Oh well, I'm sure we can rustle up some Livita. <laughs>、um, will we see you in church tomorrow? If you do, it'll be a miracle.、Uh, nice talking to you. Come on, Roy, we're going. Um, sorry about my friend. She's just had a traumatic experience.、Oh. Coming second. It's never happened before. Reg.、Mm. Red, have you seen my Ouija board? What, what, what Ouija board? Oh, pay attention! The one I use in Blythe Spirit. I'm ten minutes late for rehearsals. I've got a splitting headache, and you make no effort to help. Oh, that's the microwave. I've heated up some of that raisin woman's quiche for you. Actually, it looks quite appetising. Much as I can't stand the woman, I'm surprised you didn't let her win. Hmm. Well, she did face some very stiff competition. Well, I know why I didn't win, because I haven't got what Nancy Cartwright's got. What? Boobs like twin airbags. <laughs> Shut up. Pour some more gin. 
I mean, I went to all the trouble of trudging around the shops. Uh, 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 excuse me, I did that. Well, I sent you. I hired London's very best pastry chef, but he gives the prize to salmonella on toast. Oh, well, I hate to interrupt your embittered rant, but I really do need some beauty sleep. I'm on the early train tomorrow. I'll drop you off on my way to church. Oh, no, Aggie. You've not found God, have you? I need all the friends I can get. I mean, right now, what have I got to look forward to? More gin? Hmm. <clears throat> ah, hello. Are, are you alone? Oh, good. Yes, yes, the old dragon's gone out too. <laughs> No, no, just staring at the box, eating quiche. It's rather good, actually. It's from that raisin woman. What? Of course we'll really do it. Oh, believe me, Nancy. We'll have... We'll have another go, and we will make a break for it. Uh, uh, we'll... Look, hold on. I, I'm not feeling too clever. No, it's... It, it, look, I... I'd better, I'd better go. Very good sermon, Vicar. Very interesting. Thank you, Mrs. Harvey. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. So glad you could come. Yes, well, uh, I won't be able to make it every week. Oh, well, you're here today, at least. Oh, Mrs. Elman. Um, uh, excuse me, madam. Are you Mrs. Agatha Raisin? Yes. I am Police Constable Griggs. This is Detective Constable Wong. Perhaps we could have a word. You'd better come to the cottage. Now, look, if it's about that speeding ticket... It's nothing to do with that, Mrs. Raisin. It's about your neighbour, Reginald Cummings Brown. Oh, that old bore. What's he done now? Not a lot. He's dead. What? He's dead. And we believe he may have been poisoned. Well, what's that got to do with me? I don't feed him. His wife says the last thing he ate was your quiche. They brought it home last night. But that quiche came from... That quiche was homemade. Indeed. Well, perhaps you could show us how you made it. Yes. Right, right, of course. It's through here. Ooh, nice kitchen. Perhaps you'd like to show us your ingredients. Well, it was a normal quiche with uh, normal things, like herbs. And where do you keep your herbs? I, I've run out. What else? The usual. Eggs. Uh, I, I think. Yes, eggs. De definitely eggs. And these eggs would be... Um... In the fridge. I suppose you had the last one for breakfast, did you? And uh, what else? Um, uh, flour. And where's that, then? In here. Uh, no, not, not that one, sorry. Uh, oh, heavens. Damn these cupboards. Things are never where you put them. Mrs Raisin, perhaps your flour is behind the microwave Indian banquet or the boil-in-the-bag spaghetti bolognese. Might be. Mrs Raisin, in my humble opinion, you would have to look up the ingredients to make a boiled egg. Uh, yes, officer. Guilty as charged. So, where did this quiche come from? Economides quicherie in Chelsea. Oh, dear. Please don't tell anyone I cheated. No, I won't need to. They'll read all about it in the local paper. You've reached the answer phone of Agatha Raisin. Please leave a message. Oh, hello, Aggie. It's me. Just calling to say thanks for... Fab weekend. I've been ever so busy. I'm sorry it's taken me so long. Uh, to Roy, it's me. Oh, yeah. Cool screening, eh? What have you been up to? Oh, dear. You haven't heard. Remember the quiche competition? Yeah. I poisoned the judge. You what? He took my quiche home, ate it, dropped down dead. It's cowbane poisoning, apparently. No. Hang on, a cow bane? Is that, is that like mad cow disease? No, it's a plant. It grows on marshland and somehow it got mixed up with the spinach. But I spent 25 quid on that quiche. It was organic. Precisely, so they don't use weed killer. Hence, weeds get mixed up with the spinach. I know, but even 
So, what are the chances? Right, I've been reading about it on the internet. It happens occasionally. Most people survive, but Reg had a weak heart. It still sounds strange. Is there anyone actually benefits from Reg being dead? Well, it gives us something to talk about. And uh, Vera is lapping up the weeping widow role. I'm not surprised she's such a star of amateur dramatics, swanning round the village, telling anyone who listened that she wants to be alone. Who else was close to Reg? Well, there's that woman who won. Nancy Cartwright. Terrible cook. Breasts like Dolly Parton. Perhaps I should go and talk to her. Where do women in white stilettos go for entertainment? Like I'd know. Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, oh, well, how about bingo halls? Bingo, yes. I'll try that. Look, Aggie, please be careful. People can get very angry if you poke your finger into things like that. Yes, that. thanks, Roy. I've got to go. Someone at the door. I'm coming! Mrs Bloxby. Oh, my dear Mrs Raisin, I do hope we're not disturbing you, but Mrs Cummings-Brown here wanted a word. Yeah. Uh, please, come in. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, would you like a tea, a coffee? Oh, no, thank you, Mrs Raisin. This is very hard, but I just want to say, I forgive you. We all make mistakes, and sometimes our mistakes have terrible consequences. You couldn't have known. I mean, such a lot of food scares these days that there must be something very wrong with the world. There, there, dear. Do you have a tissue? Oh, dear. I just feel so alone. What am I going to do with my life now? Well, you've always got your amateur dramatics. Yes. Oh, my poor Reg. I want to go home. Of course, my dear. I'll come with you. No. I want to be alone. Shall we go after her? Oh, no, no. She needs a little while to collect her thoughts. One sees a lot of this as a vicar's wife. We're always here for the lost and the bereaved. I feel rather lost myself at the moment. And as if Reg's death wasn't enough, now the whole village knows I'm a cheat. Oh, dear. Well, there has been some gossip, of course, but people are still a bit sensitive. Last month, the village shop was raided by a man wearing a, a monkey mask. They're all convinced the robber must have come from London. Why? <laughs> well, because, of course, no one from round here could do such a thing. Oh, honestly, <laughs> why are people so ignorant? Oh, I know, but once you've spent some time in Carsley, you'll find we're not as small-minded as you think. Well, right now, I'm tempted to sell up and go home. Oh, and I thought perhaps you'd found a new home here. I was going to invite you to the Carsley Ladies' Society. We have a charity auction coming up, and, well, with all your experience, you could have... Oh, well, Carsley Ladies, that sounds fun. But, um, do you know, Mrs Bloxby, living in a village, what I miss most is a really good game of bingo. Oh, <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Raisin, forgive me, I wouldn't have put you down as an aficionado at bingo, but yes, we do have sessions in the village hall on Wednesdays. Thank you. I must go along and try my luck. Oh. <laughs> All right then, ladies, highs down, everybody, for your full house. Oh, oh, excuse Here me. Here we go. I'm so sorry. Excuse me, is this seat taken? Oh, you can have it. I'm off. My numbers never come up. Just a minute. I'm sure I've seen you before. Aren't you Nancy Cartwright? Well, you're Mrs. Reason. Oh, it's a terrible business about Reg. I know. I still can't believe a perfectly ordinary quiche can kill someone. You're not the only one. What? Mind you, was Andy having an incomer in the village they could blame? Nancy, are you saying what I think you're saying? I might be. Oh, let's get out of here. Well, I need it just across the road. The one with the... Ah, uh, that's right. The one with the rusty car on the front lawn. Yeah, that's me. Oh, it's dry London gin, Angostura bitters. I never liked the stuff till Reg got me onto it. Thank you. Nancy, what do you really think happened to Reg? I don't know. <laughs> Reg was a randy old bugger. He said I was the living spit of Marilyn Monroe, the only woman he'd ever loved. Oh, but he said that to lots of women. Did Vera know? Of course she knew. Never seemed to mind, though. Oh, come off it. 
Vera, Lady of the Manor, Cummings, Brown. Well, they never seemed to last. Red had his flings and then they'd leave him. I don't know why. But I was different. He was going to stay with me, run away with me. Oh, yes? Last hour of his supper. Said he'd had enough of Lady Snobby controlling him, putting him down. Said he'd meet me outside the Red Lion after midnight. And we'd drive off together. Be two little lovebirds living up in the south of France. And yet you're still here, drinking pink gin. I couldn't do it. After the meal, I come home, packed some things and had a bath. I lay there. I could hear my husband snoring on the sofa. And I just closed my eyes for a minute. When I wake up, it's three o'clock in the morning. I've turned into a prune. I couldn't do it. No, I never can. Nancy! Oh, look, that's my husband. I just been reading about Reg Cummins Brown. He had coming, if you ask me. Who's she? Well, this is Mrs Raisin from Puddle Duck Cottage. Just called social-like. What do you want? I'm collecting money. Children in need. What about out-of-work labourers in need? Uh, quite. Well, um, I'll be off then. Yeah, you've got a nerve. Begging for our notes from the likes of us. I haven't got a penny. Her sink to that. Oh, John. Oh, not in front of Mrs. Raisin. Nancy, if you want me to stay, I will. No, no, please go. Well, you know where I am if you need me. Don't come back. Home, sweet home. Nicotine, sweet nicotine. Oh, honestly. Morning, Mrs. Raisin. Remember me? Constable Wong. How could I ever forget? Please call me Bill. Come in, Bill. What have I done now? Oh, nothing. I come bearing gifts. And a little something in my basket here. Have a look. That's a cat. We can't get nothing past you, can we? Oh, <laughs> she's the runt of the litter. And if we don't find her a home, she's going to be drowned. There must be someone in the village. Well, I've tried everyone. But I can't have a cat. Oh, dear. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with her, then. Oh, I see. You come here as a friend, call me Bill, but you're testing me to see if I could do it. What? You want to see if I could allow a creature to be killed, to see if I'm capable of it. <sighs> Mrs. Raisin, no one's accusing you of anything. We're absolutely satisfied it was accidental. But I have got another reason for giving you this. Oh, yes? But a little birdie told me... You were thinking of leaving. And I thought, well, an animal might make you feel more at home here. I mean, <laughs> she certainly made herself at home. Oh, uh, look at her there, scratching your furniture. No! Not the chaise long, oh. please. <laughs> so, um, why do you want me to stay? Maybe I like you. And with you here, I'm not the only outsider. Outsider? You're a pillar of the community. Well, I'm a Gloucester boy, but my dad's half Chinese. So to a lot of people, I'm an alien. Half the village thinks I'm an alien. And the other half thinks I'm a murderer. So, what do the police give me for protection? A terrifying, ferocious, tiny orange kitten. <laughs> we do things differently in the Cotswolds. Look, I'll leave you two to get better acquainted. No, wait. I'll call back tomorrow, see how you're getting on. But I don't want a cat. Oh, you'll come to love her. Bye. Thank you very much. No, not under the sofa. I'll never get you out, and I'm already late for the Carsley Lady Society. Come here. Come here. Oh, you need a name. I've never named a cat. Back in London, I'd hire market researchers and road test the alternatives with demographic groups, but I think I'll call you Chivers. Oh, Mrs Raisin, I'm so glad you came. You find us in the midst of some embroidery. Embroidery? We're working on the Carsley Ladies' Tapestry. It's a pageant of 500 years of village life. We're displaying it at the auction. I haven't sewed since I was eight. Ah, well, your job is to wander around and say, that looks nice. <laughs> now, if you'd like to go on through, I'll join you shortly, but I must just replenish these macaroons. Oh, hello, Mrs Raisin. Nancy, nice to see you again. Yeah. Sorry about my John. I mean, you caught him on one of his off days. How are things at home? Oh, fine. Absolutely fine. Come on, I'll show you the tapestry. Nancy, 
This is beautiful. I know. All our lives laid out in six-inch squares. Over 50 years old, this is. Really? The village seems rather fond of animals. Why is there a gorilla in the village shop? Oh, that's the evil so-and-so what robbed my shop. That's right, the man in the monkey mask. Slightly unusual subject matter for a tapestry. Well, Mrs Bloxby didn't want me to put it on, but I said it's traditional. We've always included everything what's happened. And there's his getaway car, see, pointing towards London. Oh, yes. And how did you deduce he came from London? Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? A lot of bad things come from London. Oh. Oh, come on, Mrs Raisin. Why don't you try a few stitches? Because I really don't want to ruin it. Oh. I didn't think you looked the type to sew. You'd pay someone to do it for you. <sighs> Miss Harvey, are your scissors blunt? No. No, they're fine. I'm surprised when you've spent ten minutes stabbing me in the back. Oh, I just like a bit of honesty in people, that's all. I know I cheated in the competition. I know you believe in the ethnic cleansing of anyone south of Watford. But why do you think I went to all that effort to win a pastry competition? I suppose you were in it for the money, like all London people. Do you really think I would spend £25 on a quiche so I could win a tenner? Will you tell me then? Why did you do it? I did it because I want to fit in. I want to be part of a community, but if you don't want me, then that's fine. There's always Tuscany. Macaroons, anyone? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, may I have a word, please? I'm sorry, Mrs. Bloxby. I seem to turn every occasion into a blazing row. Oh, in the Church of England, we call it a challenging discussion. But it's not about that. Mrs. Mason and I were just discussing the charity auction. Now, usually she is the auctioneer, but she says, as you have such a lovely speaking voice, this year would you do the honours? At last, something I can do. Making a noise and making money. I'd be delighted. Chivers, where are you hiding now? Oh, not under the sofa again. My poor knees. Oh, what's the mat? Someone in the garden. Chivers! Chivers, mind, mind the glass. Come here. Let, let, let me pick you up. It's a brick. There's a note wrapped round it. It says, I should sell up and go back to London. Only a language I wouldn't dream of using in front of a kitten. Thanks, Charlie. Right, Mrs. Raisin, that should keep you safe till morning. If you give this number a buzz, they do very good security windows. I still won't feel safe. Someone in this village doesn't want me around. Some prat who doesn't have the guts to show his face is making a protest about outsiders moving in. I hope that's what it is. I hope it isn't personal. Well, that's happened before. I have my suspicions. I'll get that. Oh, Detective Constable Wong. Is Mrs. Raisin all right? We heard there'd been a break-in. Come in, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh. I'm fine. Well, well, I'll leave you two ladies together. Mrs. Bloxby, Mrs. Raisin, I'll drop by in the morning. Thanks, Bill. Such a nice young man. Oh, my dear, you have been through the wars. Whatever happened? A spot of redecorating. Oh. Someone decided my window would look better without any glass. Oh, heavens. Well, is there any broken glass on the sofa? I don't think so. Why? Because that's where I'm sleeping tonight. You don't want to be alone in the house. Oh, I couldn't let you go to all that trouble. Oh, nonsense. You may come from London, where people don't know who their neighbours are, but we do things differently here. Come along now. Hello? Roy, it's me. Someone put a brick through my window. No. Uh, are you all right? Get the police. They've been. It's like Fort Knox in here. And I've got Mrs Bloxby downstairs, but I still don't feel safe. Well, what can I do? I'm 80 miles away. Well, I know it's short notice, but uh, can you come down for the weekend? I mean, there's a charity auction. You'd love that. Well, I'm snowed under with work. I'm doing an Easter egg campaign and I'm meeting Dawn French, who's going to be the Easter bunny. I... Oh, Dawn French is more important than me, is she? Uh, no, I never said that. Let's not forget who got you that job. Other people on the panel thought you were superficial, but I said, no, this is a man with real integrity. Oh, 
All right, all right. Also, also, I found out Reg had affairs with several women, which points the finger at Vera. But the police say she never cooked. She had a brand new fitted kitchen, and she'd only ever use the money. Look, Aggie, it's the middle of the night. Stop playing detective. I'm not playing. I'm deadly serious. I'll see you Friday. <sighs> all right. Night, night. That's right, darling. Still with Mrs. Raisin. Oh, about midday, I should think. See you then. Bye. Good morning. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Hope you didn't mind my using your phone. Did you sleep? I did. But I was woken by a hungry kitten and the smell of coffee. Yes, well, I was going to bring it up to you, but... Alas, you've beaten me to it. Sugar? Oh, no, thanks. I'm dieting. Oh, but I will have one of those nice chocolate digestives. Mrs. Bloxby, I've been thinking... Oh, yes, dear. This charity auction, I have some items to offload. Oh, what kind of items? Well, I have some useless trinkets from my PR days, presents from pop stars, mm. gold discs, and uh, my furniture is too big for this cottage. I mean, look at this widescreen TV. It's blocking out the sunlight. Good heavens, you can't give that away. Have you seen what's on TV these days? No. Everything must go except me and Chivers. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. That's the most marvellous news. Well, I hope you get a few quid for them. No, no, not that. I mean, it's marvellous news that you're staying. But what made you decide to stay? The brick through my window telling me to go. I've never much cared for Nazis. If they want to fight, I can be very, very dangerous. Are you quite sure about this, Bill? No. Well, I can usually tell if someone's guilty by the look on their face when they answer the door. Morning, Mrs. Cartwright. Is your husband at home? Uh, no, I, I don't know where he is. Hey, there he is. Oh, no. Don't no, leave him alone. John! Oh, hey, there, Bill. Look up there. <laughs> my, my, my. You have been a busy boy. <laughs> I know my rights. I love you. I love you both. And blow me, there it was on top of his wardrobe. His own personal monkey mask. It was him who raided Mrs. Harvey's shop. We've been after him for months. Well, thanks for telling me, but what's it got to do with me? Get down, Chiffers. Well, he put a brick through your window because he thought you were on to him. Apparently, you'd been to see his wife. Poor Nancy. Well, she's better off without that ape. But one thing does puzzle me. Why did you go and visit her? It's a free country. And she makes a very good pink gin. Because if I thought you were trying to undermine a police investigation... Bill, look me in the eye and tell me. Do you think Reginald Cummings Brown was murdered? That is of no concern to you whatsoever. In other words, yes, I knew it. Oh, Agatha Raisin, when we investigate a murder, we find out the most terrible things and people get hurt. This isn't a murder, so why keep on digging? Why risk hurting people? Because it's what I do, Bill. I'm in PR. I spend half my life burying my clients' dirty secrets, the other half digging up other people's. I'm too old to change now. You could get your fingers burnt, Mrs. Raisin. You really could. Now, speaking of dirty secrets, you've got a man on your doorstep dressed in a cowboy suit. Oh, that'll be Roy. Roy! You made it. Oh, yeah, I did. And Dawn French is not a happy bunny. Uh, Bill, this is Roy. Roy, Bill. Oh, hello. Uh, right. Well, I'll be on my way then. Uh, remember what I said. Well... Who's your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend. He happens to be a police officer. Yeah. Well, they've obviously changed the height restrictions. He's a very nice man, just rather annoying. He says I should forget about this Reg business. I think you should listen to the little munchkin. I mean, so what if she did kill her husband? She's hardly likely to do it again, is she? Roy, that's a shocking attitude. I'm not surprised this country's going down the swanee. If you turn a blind eye to things like... Aggie. Do my eyes deceive me, or is that a cat? Oh, I forgot. You don't like them, do you? Indeed. Please, tell me you're collecting them to make a fur coat. It was foisted on me. They were going to drown it. What was I meant to do? Give me a bucket of water and I'll show you. Roy, I'm trying to change my image. It's goodbye, Cruella de Vil. Hello, Mother Teresa. Oh, that reminds me of the charity auction. Now... I need you to try on a medieval jester's outfit. You, you are joking. No. Cap and bells, the whole caboodle. Well, I look an absolute fool. 
Yes, that's the idea. Now, you're to stand by the A44 and drum up trade. Oh, what sort of trade? Well, you know, American tourists, people in flash cars, people I can fleece. And this is you being Mother Teresa, is it? No. The cash and carry are donating refreshments. I must double-check the papers are coming. And the brass bands say they won't. But if I threaten press exposure, I'm sure they will. (laughs) Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the Cotswold, Earthquake Agatha, Force 9 on the Richter scale. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you to our wonderful village band. Now, on with the auction. Lot 17. It's a memento from my days promoting pop stars. It's a large turquoise hat with a hand-embroidered unicorn and a photo of the man who gave it to me. Boy George. And do I hear 20 pounds? Of course I do. Oh, Alf, dear, it's all going so well. We've raised hundreds. I do admit Mrs. Raisin is a bit of a human dynamo. Oh, here comes her friend. Oh, he looks quite the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Silver, you must be delighted. Do I look delighted? I'm stood by the A44, jangling me fool's cap while millions of Americans make home movies of me. It is for charity. <laughs> I've got compassion fatigue. I'm off. I've found a pub that does pims with little umbrellas. Here she comes, the woman of the moment. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, you must be absolutely exhausted. On the contrary, I feel cleansed. How does that song go? Imagine no possessions. Well, I don't have to imagine. From now on, it's me and Chivers and a whole new life. Well, I wish we all had that attitude. Well, I must go and thank the village band. Have they finished? We'll have crowds in here in a minute. <laughs> um, I'll help with the tea. Oh, goodness, you are keen. Well, you can assemble the cream teas. Right. Mrs Cartwright can help you. Mrs Cartwright, uh, didn't you hear? Her husband was arrested. It was because I... Oh, yes, I, I did hear, and that's why it's important you talk to her. Oh, here she comes. Um, I'll go and get some more plates. All right, Mrs. Reason. Nancy, I'm so sorry. I had no idea your husband was involved with anything. I only wanted to know oh, about Oh, don't Reg. fret yourself. Bet you done me more of a favour. At least I won't get no more of these. Your husband did that to you? That's right. Never mark my face, though. Cunning sod. Still, I... Don't have to say I walked into doors now. Now I can go through them. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, oh, one final favour. Uh, could you um, pop across the road to the village hall, get some scones from the freezer, defrost them in the microwave? Yes, of course. Oh, now, uh, you want the little freezer by the door, not the big one under the window where Vera keeps her pastries. Vera keeps what? Oh, uh, Vera bought us a deep freeze last year. It's full of her cakes and pastries. Any dinner dance, harvest festival, Vera takes control. They're all in there, colour-coded. No one understands her system except her. Let Mrs. Bloxby, is it all right if I go home? Oh, uh, are you feeling poorly? No, I just have the sudden urge to organise a little tea party. Hello, Mrs. Cummings-Brown. Oh, Mrs. Rosen, uh, how was the auction? We raised enough to save a few souls. Oh, I would have liked to have come, but I don't feel ready. Where are my manners? Do come in. Actually, I was going to invite you to my house for tea. Oh, I'll just go turn off my television. And I'll go and put the kettle on. Uh, Sugar? Oh, do, please. I couldn't trouble you for a biscuit, could I? Oh, yes. I think I've got some digestives. Oh! (laughs) My word, Mrs. Raisin, your cottage looks quite bare. I beg your pardon? I said your cottage looks bare without the television. Sometimes you have to lose things to make a fresh start. Uh, Drink up, your tea's getting cold. Oh, so's yours. Well, thank you for the tea and biscuits. But I have a feeling you summoned me here for a reason. I wanted to talk to you about Reg. Ah. It's touching that such a lot of people miss him. You weren't the only weeping woman at the inquest. Mrs. Raisin, what are you suggesting? Well, I went to see Nancy Cartwright, and she told me that Reg had been planning to run off with her. But the night they were due to do it, she went home from the dinner dance and fell asleep. You cooked for that dinner dance, didn't you? 
I feed the whole village, Mrs. Raisin. Yes, I've seen your deep freeze in the village hall, a quiche for every occasion. One sends you to sleep, one sends you into eternal sleep. Well done, Mrs. Raisin. I wondered when you'd find out. There's even a quiche with a tiny dose of E. coli. A couple of Reggie's lovers suffered a nasty case of the runs, but Nancy was different. She just would not let go. So you had to find another way to end their affair. Well, it all seemed to fall into place. You moved in, a suitable outsider to take the blame. I already had three cowbane quiches in the freezer. Cowbane grows all round here. I remember that night. I came home. And I knew he had eaten it. I saw him laying there dead. But I could hear his voice in my head saying, Come on, old thing. Up the stairs. Don't look in the living room. It's not a pretty sight. You go up to bed now. You can wake up in the morning and find me, be grief-stricken for a while, and then start a whole new life. I've had my fun, Vera. Now it's your turn. Well, Mrs. Raisin, you're not saying anything. I'm so hot. I like the heat. Don't you? It does seem to be making you rather drowsy. Oh, my God. What a profoundly stupid move to take tea with a poisoner. When your back was turned, I simply added some pills obtained from a doctor who oh. owes me a favour. They've even got your name on the bottle. Oh, Poor Mrs. Raisin, they'll say. It all got too much for her. Oh. Get out of my way, you stupid cat. Oh, cigarettes. Such a filthy habit. And three days heat. Your house should go up like Guy Fawkes night. Mrs. Raisin? N nurse? Do you feel well enough for visitors? Oh, I think so. Oh, Bill. Morning, Mrs. Raisin. How are you doing? Still rather hot, shaky and scared. Well, it's all over. I brought you a little picture for your bedside locker. Chivers. Oh, is she all right? She's fine. I'm looking after her. That little kitten saved your life. How? And when the fire started and she had nowhere to run, she climbed on your face, which made you vomit. How do you know that? She sold her story to the Corsley Gazette. Oh, yes, and I could tell by the scratch marks on your face. How's my cottage? Well, it'll have to be re-thatched. That Vera Cummings Brown caused the death of five million weevils. She's under arrest now. Poor Vera. She was just like me, really. Didn't want anybody else stealing her prize. Well, you get some rest. Oh, here comes your friend. See you later. Aggie, you'll be pleased to know you're in all the papers. Midlands today is calling you the Columbo of the Cotswolds. Oh. And the Gloucester Echo calls you Miss Marple with Attitude. Shut up, Roy. Oh, charming. We're so glad to have you back in the land of the living. I'm alive, am I? That's nice to know. You certainly are. I think this country air must really agree with you. Indeed. Where are my cigarettes? In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha. Jennifer Piercy was Vera Cummings Brown. Chris Emmett was Reg Cummings Brown. And David Holt was Roy. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy. DC Wong by Ben Crow. And Nancy Cartwright by Beth Chalmers. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton. And the producer was Carol Smith. Now on the UK Station of the Year, we visit the Cotswold village of Carsley for the first in a new series about a retired public relations executive who likes to while away the hours chasing men and solving murders. There, there, little Charlie. The nice vet will make you much better. All right, Mrs. Joseph. Mr. Blayton will see you now. Oh, thank you. Come along, Charlie. Come along. Hello, Mrs. Josephs. How's dear old Charlie? 
Oh, he's not at all well. Well, look at him. He's shivering. And if you try and stroke him, he winces. Well, he is a grand old gentleman now, and older doggies do get aches and pains. But he hardly touched his dinner last night, and it was lamb's liver, his favourite. Oh, I think it's just a flare-up of his arthritis. I can change his dosage of glucosamine. Uh, that'll make his joints a bit less creaky. I keep thinking there's something we must miss it. Well, aren't there some tests you could do on him? Well, I could, but it'll mean keeping him overnight. Oh, yes, but he's always happy with you. <laughs> it'll be a little doggy holiday. <laughs> All right, Mrs Josephs. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, then. There's a brave soldier, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Good boy. <laughs> Oh, hello again, Mrs. Joseph. Uh, what can we do for you now? Well, if Charlie's going to stay all night, I've brought him his special blanket, and I've got a list of all the things he does and doesn't like. Uh, I'll pass it on for you. Now, he won't touch sausages, and anything in a tin makes him nauseous. I know just how he feels. I'll go and tell Mr. Blake. Mrs. Josephs, you can't go in there. Uh, uh, Mrs. Josephs, I, I was just about to phone you. Hello, little Charlie. I... <gasps> What's happened to him? I'm afraid he reacted badly to the anaesthetic. Anaesthetic? Well, you, you never said he needed an operation. He suddenly took a turn for the worse, and I had to act fast. Oh. But I'm afraid we lost him. Oh, oh Charlie. My, my poor little Charlie. What has he done to you? Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 1. The Vicious Vet. Mrs Bloxby, how lovely to see you. Oh, Mrs Raisin, please tell me it isn't true. What isn't true? That you're leaving us. There was a for sale sign outside your house and then that disappeared and we all thought you'd gone back to London but then your car appeared in the drive and we thought... Mrs Bloxby, very... I am not leaving this village. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, <laughs> I brought you round a lemon cake as a leaving present but, um, well, if you're staying, uh, we can still eat it to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> How could I ever leave a village which has people like you in it? <laughs> Come in, I've just made some coffee. Oh. Oh, hello, Chivers. You must be glad you're staying in Carsley. London's no place for a cat. Tell that to Dick Whittington. <laughs> I, I can't remember. Do you take sugar? Uh, no, no, I'm still on my diet. There is a bit of a losing battle, I'm afraid. Um, shall I cut the cake? Yes, of course. So, where have you been the past few weeks? Well, in theory, I've been setting up a PR company in London. Here's your coffee. Oh, thank you. I thought you'd retired. And so did I. But then they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Oh, I see. Is that what they call a big fat paycheck? <laughs> it wasn't exactly fat, more big boned. An old colleague of mine got in touch. He was setting up a PR company and needed a bit of help with the start-up costs. A new company? How exciting. So it seemed. In return for my investment, I would be made a director with a substantial salary and he had some very high-profile clients. Jobson's Electrics, Hazelmere Food. Good heavens, that's a good start. Mm. That's what I thought. I was introduced to their managing director at a launch party I paid for. You know, everyone stands around eating little nibbles, pretentious ingredients in puff pastry. Sounds rather glamorous. I should hope it was. It certainly cost a few, Bob. And as I bit into a quail's egg vol -vent, I suddenly realised why this <clears throat> man was strangely familiar. Why? He'd been on TV the week before in an episode of Casualty. Goodness! You'd think a top businessman would be far too busy to do any acting. <laughs> he wasn't a businessman. He was an actor. He played a surgeon on Casualty. And he certainly tried to stitch me up. Actually, he was a con man. They were all con men. The whole thing was a sham. My so-called friend had fallen on hard times and tried to get me to invest in a non-existent business. Oh, dear! That's why I like living in a village. The only major fraud is when someone cheats in a pastry competition. Please don't remind me. You know, Mrs Bloxby, sometimes I think my year in Carsley has made me lose my killer instinct. <laughs> I must have a cigarette. Mm. 
So what's been happening while I've been away? Oh, we've got some very exciting news. You have a new next-door neighbour, a retired colonel called James Lacey. A colonel? Oh, sounds promising. He's moved to the countryside to write military history. That's not so good. Another wet drip comes to Carsley. He seems rather sweet in a bookish kind of way. Oh, and at long last we have a vet. And about time too. I'm fed up with taking Chivers all the way to Mercester. His name's Paul Bladen. It looks rather like Robert Redford. Really? I must take Chivers along for a checkup. Oh, why? She seems quite perky at the moment. Well, you can't be too careful. Ah, nice shiny coat, lovely bright eyes. Mrs. Raisin, I have to say your cat is a picture of health. Now, if you're still worried, I could take her temperature. Thank you. That would put my mind at rest. Oh, just hold her steady. Here we go. Do be careful with her. Don't worry, I've done this many, many times. It's all right, Chivers. It's all right. Yeah, 38 degrees. This is a very healthy cat. Maybe I'm just being overprotective, but she's not been the same since I collected her from the cattery. Oh, you've been abroad? No. I was setting up a new PR company in London. Oh, you're a professional. I have run one or two international companies. Well, I'm impressed, I have to say. It's nice to meet someone who's got an interesting job. Carsley's a lovely place, but I I do miss a stimulating conversation. I know what you mean. (laughs) Mrs Raisin... I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but I've heard there's a rather nice French restaurant in Evesham called La Lune, and I'd love to have someone to visit it with. That's not being presumptuous at all. And please, call me Agatha. Agatha. And I'm Paul. Oh, Chivers, I am so, so sorry about the thermometer. Let's get you home. Lucky, please, do calm down. Excuse me, can you keep your dog under control? I hardly think Lucky's going to bite through your animal's basket. Well, if he does, he'll soon be dead, Lucky. Oh, don't listen to her, Lucky. Lucky, Lucky, Lucky. You're Frida Huntingdon, aren't you? Do I know you? You're in the Carsley Lady Society. I went once. It was full of small-minded individuals. Is Paul in? If you have an appointment. Oh, I don't need one of those. Uh, Paul! Darling. Frida, come in. Don't worry, Chivers. The nasty animal has gone, and she's taken her dog with her. Well, Chivers, what shall I wear to impress your lovely vet? I have got this little black dress. Oh, um... Hello there, Agatha. Bill Wong, come in. Oh, thank you. Long time no see. Well, it's been very quiet round here. We haven't had any murders recently. You must have been on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, getting ready to meet a friend for dinner. Are you calling about anything in particular? No, no, just for a chat. Do I know this friend? You might do. It's Paul Bladen, our new vet. Oh, dear, I had a feeling it might be. Saw you outside his surgery the other day. Why didn't you stop and say hello? Well, you walked straight past me. You had a faraway look in your eyes, and you had quite a job keeping your balance with those high heels you had on. Do I detect a note of ridicule? Agatha, when that man came to this village, everyone thought the sun shone out of his... Well, you know, where he sticks his thermometer. But now people are starting to talk. And what are they saying? They say he's not quite as caring as he seems. Mrs Josephs insists he put her ducks in sleep without even consulting her. Well, if he did, I'm sure there was a good reason. Vets do not kill animals. They keep them alive so they can fleece their owners. All I'm saying is be careful the company you keep. And if you're going out tonight, do watch the road. There's ice and snow on the way. It's a perfectly mild evening. Things can change very quickly in the Cotswolds. Hmm. Well, Agatha, how is your duck a l'orange? Do you want the polite answer or the honest one? Oh, dear. Hit me with the honest one. On the positive side, the duck is definitely dead. On the negative side, why do they have to cremate it? (laughs) It is rather singed. Their standards are definitely slipping. Oh, have you been here before? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I did come when it first opened. Uh, As I recall, the food was quite reasonable. Uh, Tell me some more about your PR company. That, That sounded fascinating. 
there's nothing to say, really. I ran it for th 20 years, and when the business was worth more than a cottage in the country, I sold it and bought a cottage in the country. <laughs> You're so lucky, Agatha. You had a dream, and you made it happen. It took more than dreaming. It was mostly fighting and kicking and screaming and shouting. <laughs> What's your dream? Mm. Well, I've always dreamed of having my own veterinary hospital right here in the Cotswolds. I mean, there's so much demand from farmers as well as pet owners, but as always, it's the funding. <laughs> you should try the Carsley Lady Society. They're awfully good at fundraising. <laughs> It'll take a little bit more than a few bring and buy sales, though I imagine a successful businesswoman like yourself could give me a few tips. Well, my first tip is never allow your suppliers to rip you off, <laughs> which I have to say is what this restaurant is doing to you right now. Oh dear. Agatha? This was a terrible choice of restaurant, but I do know a place that does rather good coffee. And if you like, breakfast. <laughs> so, how long have you lived here for? Ten years. Before I started working in Carsley, I had a practice with my brother in Evesham. What made you leave? I'm always in the mood for an adventure. Now, let me... Take your coat. Paul, I'm... Oh, Agatha, please. What's the matter? Well, it's just been such a long time. Oh, don't worry. It's just like riding a bicycle. I beg your pardon? I mean, you don't forget. Thank you for that image, Paul. I, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and thanks for, for supper. And if I have any fundraising ideas, I should be in touch. Oh, Agatha! <laughs> Can't you at least stay for coffee? I'm on a detox. You've had far too much to drink. Uh, then I'll, I'll drive slowly. It's snowing. Good. I'll have the road all to myself. <sighs> the woman's mad. Totally, utterly mad. Dear God, I know I haven't spoken to you for 30 years, but please get me home safe. <laughs> well, thanks for nothing. Two questions. Number one, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. Just a bit shaken. Number two, where on God's earth did you learn how to drive? Excuse me. It is extremely hard to navigate on ice. Well, Torval and Dean always used to manage. My brakes weren't working properly. No, so should have increased your stopping distance to at least six inches. There is no need to be so angry. I hardly touched your car. Oh, well done, you. Just a slight dent as opposed to the usual five-car pile-up. Look, I'm fully insured and I take full responsibility. Here's my card. What is it now? You're my next-door neighbour. What? You must be... James Lacey. Oh. Well, at least that means we're both going in the same direction. Yeah, so it does. You can go first. I refuse to be rear-ended twice in one night. I'll come in. I'll excuse the bare boards, just uh, having the place recarpeted. <laughs> Here you are. These are my insurance details. Thank you. I am sorry if I flew off the handle, but my car is a very precious thing. It's my only way to escape from this world of coffee mornings, village fates and infinite cups of tea. No, you don't like it here. No, it's not that. But I came to the countryside to write a book. And every day there's a queue of women popping in with homemade scones, gingerbread men, gingerbread cats... <laughs> They never did that for me. Oh, well, you're welcome to my leftovers. You're too kind. What's the book about? The Peninsula War. It's my uh, specialist subject. It is? My specialist subject is the price of cigarettes in supermarkets in Gloucestershire. <laughs> How's the book going? Very well. I'm just finishing the first chapter. Napoleon has persuaded Charles IV to abdicate, so we're about to have the uprising in Madrid. It's a, it's a very exciting time. Mm, fascinating. Well, I must get back. Uh, I have a cat, and if I leave her too long, she phones up social services. And you know, I sometimes feel pet owners exaggerate the talents of their prodigies. Uh, well, 
Nice bumping into you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Good night, Mrs. Rosen. Good night, Colonel Lacey. Hello, Chivers. Yes, that's right, it's me, the lady with the tin opener. I've just been to see your vet, only I wasn't quite ready for his treatment. I better phone and apologise. <laughs> Hello. Oh, um, is Paul there? I'm afraid he can't get to the phone at the moment. Excuse me, who am I speaking to? I'm Paul's wife. Who are you? Good morning, Lord Pendlebury. What? Well, who the devil are you? I'm Paul Bladen, the new vet. You wanted me to tie back the larynx of one of your horses? Oh, yes. Lucky Jim. Uh, that's him, over there in the stables. Oh, do you have any staff who can assist me with this? What? My staff have better things to do than holding your kit bag. Last chap always seemed to manage on his own. Oh, I shall see you in an hour or so with my bill. <laughs> ah, now you... Are a truly beautiful animal. Not like the mangy little flea bags I see in my surgery. Hey, 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 now, take it easy. This'll just send you to sleep. There you go. Don't you fight it. There you go. Hey, what the hell are you doing here? Look, I've done everything you told me to. I said that I would. Hey, hey get off me. No, no, please, no. Yes. Found him lying dead on the stable floor. At the moment, we reckon he fell on his syringe. But that's preposterous. Get out of the way, Chivers. Well, that's the official line. Nasty stuff in Mobilon. If it sends a horse to sleep, you can imagine what it does to a human. But surely he would have had an antidote with him. He, he did, but he didn't get to it. As with most things, it's easy to be wise after the event, but accidents do happen. Well, his wife must be devastated. Wife? He wasn't married? Really? Oh, I, I thought he was. No, he never married. I reckon his motto was why settle for one slice when you can have the whole cake. I see. So what was Paul doing to this horse? And tying back its larynx. What on earth for? Well, to stop it roaring on the racetrack. What a hideous thing to do to a horse. Oh. <laughs> Here we go, city folk getting soppy about animals. I'm sure he had a good reason for it. Lord Pendlebury loves his animals. The horse only died because there was no one around to revive it. When I went to see Pendlebury, he was weeping because a beautiful creature had died. Mind you, when I told him a human being had died too, he said yes, but that was only a vet. Hello. Oh, Mrs... Agatha. James. Have you heard the news about our vet? Yes, I have, and it's a terrible accident, but I am in the middle of writing a book. Accident? How can you accidentally stab yourself? Well, it, it's simple enough. He, he injects the tranquilizer into the horse, the horse gets a bit frisky and tries to belt, and knocks him onto his own syringe. That is the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. Agatha, as a military historian, I know many people who have died through the accidental discharge of their own weapons. And as a PR executive, I know when something stinks to high heaven and someone's trying to hush it up. James, oh. who are you talking to? Um, oh, it's only Agatha. Oh, Mrs. Rayson. You really do seem to haunt me. Mrs. Huntingdon? Oh, lucky you calm down. He's such a sweetie, but he can be a bit naughty with people he doesn't like. And so I see. I'll take him through to the kitchen. Come on, lucky. I thought you said you were writing a book. Yes, well, I was in the middle of a chapter, but then Frida called. And then ten minutes later, you called. Oh, and Frida's helping you with the book, is she? Agatha. Or did she bring round a homemade cake in the shape of Napoleon? Now, don't be like that. I'm not. Well, uh, I'll leave you and Frida to get on with your book. I just hope you don't suffer from writer's block. Mrs. Bloxby. Sorry I didn't get a chance to speak to you in church. That's quite all right, Mrs. Raisin. I had a lot of people to see. He was much loved. I think people feel he was taken far too young. Taken? Do you think it was deliberate? I mean, taken by God. Oh, yes, God. Oh, wasn't that beautiful reading the brother gave? 
Lord, you made us stewards of this creature. If it is your will, restore it to health and strength. Sorry, Mrs. Bloxby, did you say that was his brother? Oh, yes, that's right, Peter Bladen. He, he's a vet, too. Oh, not very imaginative parents. One named Peter, one named Paul. <laughs> I must go and pay my condolences. Uh, nice talking to you, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, uh, uh, will we see you at the Carsley Ladies Society tonight, Mrs. Raisin? Mrs. Raisin? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bladen? Uh, have we met? My name is Agatha Raisin. I just wanted to say I'm sorry about your brother. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. My car is just round the corner. If I can give you a lift anyway. No, thanks. I've got my own. <laughs> right. Um, uh, would it be possible at some point to have a chat about your brother? There's always been a lot of women want to talk to me about Paul, usually after he's dumped them. Not much point in talking now, though, is there? Ladies, uh, ladies, now, uh, in view of this week's sad events, uh, we've cancelled Mrs. Mason's display of Turkish belly dancing, and so this evening is going to be a rather more subdued affair. Uh, but before we go any further, I must just read the minutes of last week's meeting. Um, on, on Thursday, 20th February, there, Mr. Mrs. Jones... Mrs. Huntington, I thought Carsley ladies were too small-minded for you. I was desperate for company. Have a and seat. Thank you. followed by a much-welcomed cup of tea. <laughs> this evening, Mrs. Harvey has very generously uh, brought in some homemade apple brandy. <laughs> and I have made some low-fat cinnamon flapjack, so please do feel free to sip and munch <laughs> and mingle. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Raisin, he's all yours. Who is James Lacey? I'm through with him. I beg your pardon. What on earth makes you think I'm interested in James Lacey? The way you try to hold your stomach in whenever he's near you. Your imagination is even more lurid than your makeup. James is my next door neighbour. Nothing more. Oh, really? Well, anyway, I hope you do better than I did. All he wanted to do was talk about his book. When I just wanted to bite the buttons off his cardigan. Oh, Mrs. Huntington, how lovely to see you. Did Mr. Bladen get a good send-off? It was no less than he deserved. He was a wonderful vet. Oh, do you think so? I found him rather rough with Chivers. The man was a miracle worker. I mean, look how quickly he cured Lucky's middle ear problem. A miracle worker? What are you talking about? Bladen was a murderer. Oh, Mrs. Joseph, you're not still going on about your old dachshund, are you? Charlie was just suffering from a bit of arthritis until Bladen got his claws into him. I don't need to seem insensitive, Mrs. Josephs, but... Charlie was a rather old dog. Just a bundle of bones, really. Not long for this world. Charming. I hope no one ever says that about me. Well, Mrs. Huntington, I'm not surprised you're standing up for him. Your dog wasn't the only one to get the full treatment on his operating table. How dare you? Still, at least he cared for one animal, even if it was one with the morals of an alley cat. <laughs> Goodness, it is getting hot in here. Uh, Mrs. Huntington, uh, come and try some of my flapjacks. You malicious old crow. This, this way, Mrs. Huntington. Well, you certainly rattled her. I've bitten my tongue for long enough. They've all tried to hush me up, but I know things. About Paul? About why he came to Carsley and what he was up to. Come to my house tomorrow, Mrs. Raisin. I'll tell you all about Paul Miracle Worker Bladen. Oh, uh, Agatha. James, are you busy? Well, I am in the middle of writing a book. Are you still doing that? Yes, it may surprise you to learn. They do take considerably more than a week. Well, there's someone I want you to meet. Oh, not another coffee morning. No, somebody else in this village seems interested in Paul Bladen. You're not still hawking your conspiracy theories around, are you? I am looking for the truth, something I thought would matter to an historian. Still, I suppose your book won't bother with that. You'll just recycle fashionable opinion. Mrs. Rayson, I don't know about you, but I pay a large amount of tax, so those nice chaps of Scotland Yard can worry about this sort of thing for me. James, some things in life are too important to leave to the professionals. Oh. This country would fall apart if it wasn't for volunteers. I mean, where would the NHS be without the St. John Ambulance Brigade? Well, I'm so glad to hear you're doing it out of community spirit. For a moment, I thought you were just being nosy. Will you come and see her or not? It seems it's the only way I'm going to get you off my doorstep. Uh, I'll get my coat.
Mrs. Josephs is taking an awfully long time to answer. Well, I guess I haven't you noticed. In a whodunit, when anyone says, come and see me tomorrow, they'll always be found dead in the next scene. Don't say that, James. <laughs> Not even as a joke. Hmm. I didn't think this door is locked. Mrs. Josephs? Mrs. Josephs! She must have gone out. James, maybe I've spent too long living in London, but when I go out, I tend to lock the door. Oh. Well, I suppose she could be in the bathroom. Mrs. Josephs? Mrs. Josephs? it is. Oh, what do you think happened to her? I don't know. She's stone cold. Doesn't seem to be any sign of a struggle, though. The poor woman. Uh, have you got one of those um, you know, mobile thingies? Somewhere in my bag. Uh, he here it is. You phone the police. I need a cigarette. You can't smoke in here. Why not? There's a dead body there. And your point is? They will need to identify the cause of death. Well, they're not going to pin it on secondary smoking, are they? There's ash flying all over her. Will you just make the phone call? Has one used this thing? I'll do it. Hold the cigarette. DC Wong, please. Bill, it's Agatha. I'm afraid we've got another body for you. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy and DC Wong by Ben Crow, with John Glover as Paul Bladen and Ewan Bailey as Peter Bladen. Jilly Mears was Frieda and Joanna McCallum, Mrs. Josephs. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 2 The Body in the Bathroom. Oh, Lord. I came to this village for a quiet life. Now I'm stuck in a bathroom with a dead woman. Welcome to Carsley. We do seem to have more than our share of the dearly departed. She, she looks quite peaceful, though, sitting there with a book in her hand. Well, she was a librarian. Even in death, she looks as if she's glaring at us to be quiet. <laughs> the police are taking their time, aren't they? Probably stuck behind a tractor. Mm. Not that they can do much here. I suppose not. I hope when I go, I'm alone and peaceful with a good book beside me. Oh, look. <laughs> it's the new Maeve Binchy. What's that in her other hand? Agatha, I, I really don't think you should touch her. She's holding something. I'm going to try and wrench it out. Agatha, that's an appalling thing to do. Oh. Don't you dare. Oh, it's a syringe. <sighs> Thank you for listening to me. Don't worry, I'll put it back. With your fingerprints all over it. I hadn't thought of that. Insulatard flexipen. Oh, that'll be insulin. Was she diabetic? She must have been. But what if it wasn't insulin? What if someone substituted some poison? No, you're not still trotting out conspiracy theories, are you? James, <laughs> last night she said she knew something about Paul Bladen and asked me to come and see her, but someone else got here first. I find it so hard to follow your train of thought. I'm not even sure if thought is the right word. You do come out with these extraordinarily lurid theories. Well, then you give me a better one. Right, right oh. She's in the bathroom, administering her daily injection, but she's so engrossed in this very exciting book... She accidentally injects an air bubble. You really haven't read much Maeve Binchy, have you? No, I'm, I'm more of a John le Carre man myself. Why can't you see that there is something very sinister going on here? Two tragic accidents in one week. It's sad, but it isn't sinister. Has the world gone mad? 
Or is it just me? Probably a combination of the two. A vet is found dead with a syringe full of tranquilizer, and the police insist it was accidental. He must have fallen on it. A needle stick injury is a very common in the medical profession. And the next week we find a woman dead in exactly the same way. And somehow you manage to pin the blame on Maeve Binch. I am just saying don't jump to any conclusions. James, how many people have to die before you start to see a pattern? When the whole of the Carsley Lady Society are slumped on the floor with a cake in one hand and a syringe in the other, that'll be the police. No doubt they'll agree with your version of events. Well, Mrs Raisin, I am very disappointed in you. Bill, what have I done now? If you'd only told us what you knew last night, Mrs Josephs might still be alive. If I told you last night, you wouldn't have believed a word of it. Hang on. Are you implying that her death might have been deliberate? We are currently investigating the possibility. Forensics have taken away the syringe for analysis. Oh, yes. Can I just mention, I did actually touch that syringe. You did what? I took it out of her hand. But but I did put it back. And may I just point out, I did everything in my power to dissuade her from this course of action. I said it was ill-advised, but she wouldn't listen. Shut up, James. Of all the interfering, bungling amateurs... It was a moment of panic. We'll have to take your fingerprints. And then... I want the pair of you to go home, find yourself a hobby, and don't get into any more trouble. Message received. Loud and clear. Rest assured, as soon as we've left the station, I shall be straight back home, on with my book, and leave police business to the professionals. I do think Bill Wong's got a cheek. But I think of everything I've done for him. Agatha, will you remind me why I'm squelching my way through country lanes with a large black bin bag? You're looking for evidence. Now, we're not allowed to be nosy. But if we just happen to be two volunteers combing the hedgerows for litter... What on earth makes you think we're going to find any evidence? Do you never read detective novels? What is the first thing a murderer does immediately after the crime? I don't know. Twirls his moustache, retires to his opium den. He dumps the murder weapon. He can't risk being caught with it. So what exactly are we looking for? A blood-spattered knitting needle? Or has he left a, a signed photo with the words, I did it, honestly? I don't know. Pills, potions, anything that could be thrown from a car window. Oh, Agatha, we're both wasting our time. So far, we have no evidence at all of foul play. Then get down on your knees and find some. Oh, I do not get down on my knees for you or anybody else. And at this point, I, I really feel we should listen to Detective Constable Wong and go home before we're charged with obstructing police business. Typical. When I heard an ex-soldier had moved in next door, I thought, at long last, a man of action. Instead of which, you turn out to be a pompous, pedantic, whinging, wittering, public school-educated waste of space. Right. That does it. I have never been so insulted in my entire life. You must have been, surely. Mrs. Grayson, I was not put on this earth to be your slave. I'm going home for a cup of tea and, and the Daily Telegraph crossword. Oh, 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 someone's done. James, are you all right? What do you think? I have now fallen in a ditch. This is unlikely to go down as the happiest day of my life. Hold on, I'll pull you out. No, please don't you bother. I know what would happen. You would fall in. And the only thing worse than being stuck in a ditch is being stuck in a ditch with you. All right. I'll go and get my car and we'll go home. Agatha? James. This poison you were looking for. Do you think it will be found in a small brown bottle with the word immobile on on the label? Let me have a look. Just by my feet. James, you are a genius. If you weren't covered in mud, I'd climb down there and kiss you. Yes, well, I am, so please don't. Whatever you do, don't touch the bottle. No, of course not. That would be the action of a headstrong idiot. I'm just going to phone Bill Wong. I know he said not to interfere, but I think he'll change his mind when he sees this. Right. That's it. I just pull myself out. Oh, dear. Oh. I can't seem to get a signal. Uh, well, I'm not surprised. Don't you read the local paper? Only if I'm in it. Why? What did I miss? Well, they're going to build a mast here, but the village has organised a petition to stop them spoiling an area of natural beauty. Honestly, some people are so selfish. Well, I'll go to the Red Lion. I'm sure they've got a pay phone. Right. I'll see you at home later. No, James, you have to stay here and guard the evidence. I beg your pardon? Why should that be my job? You used to be a soldier. Pretend you're on sentry duty. But look at the clouds. I'm going to get wet. You're already wet. Uh, I'll be back soon with the police. Uh, Mrs. Rayson, I have other things to do. My, my book on the Peninsula War won't write itself. I've got, I've got so many things to worry about. Uh, the death of Napoleon. 
Siege of Saragossa. Oh, hello there, Mrs. Raisin. Mrs. Huntingdon. We've just heard the news about dear Mrs. Joseph, so poor thing. She was looking a little frail last night. Mrs. Joseph's was in perfect health until someone broke into her house and killed her. Oh, dear. You're not still acting out your little Miss Marple fantasies, are For your information, I have just found the poison the killer used. No. Yes. Now, where's the payphone? Oh, it's just at the end of the bar, but someone's using it. Oh, get a move on. You can't be serious, then. How do you know it's poison you found? We don't at the moment. That's why we need the police to confirm it. Who's we? Myself and James Lacey. Oh, are you still trying for that little flirtation with him? It's so nice when someone has a fling later on in life. Yes. Although with your alcohol consumption, I doubt you'll live long enough for many more. <laughs> Do say. In any case, James and I are next door neighbours, nothing more. Well, I don't blame you. When I first met him, I thought, ooh, a colonel. How exciting. How does that song go? There's something about a soldier. Well, I looked everywhere for it, but I couldn't find it. Well, James has been a bachelor so long, he's not going to throw himself at just anybody. Anyway, I've got bigger fish to fry than James Lacey. I've bumped into an old flame, and we're giving things a second chance. Much as I would love to discuss your emotional ups and downs, the phone is now free, and I have a life. Are you wasting your time with him? All he cares about is that wretched book. I mean, I've been with married men before, but not one who was married to Napoleon. Hello, Bill. It's Agatha. We've got something for you. Now, Mrs. Raisin, I thought I said something about staying at home and finding yourself a hobby. I found one, keeping the Cotswolds tidy. A likely story. Anyhow, I'm glad you saw sense this time and let us in on your little detective games. Don't patronise me. This bottle is going to solve the case for you, and it's all thanks to me. Oh, and James standing in the rain looking after it. So whereabouts did you leave it? Well, it was somewhere around here. I recognised those stinging nettles and the abandoned supermarket trolley. Uh, pull in at this lay-by. All right. I'm sure it was here. It must have been. What's that sticking out of the roadside? Where? Down there. little flag or something. Oh, I don't know. Let's go and have a look. Well, Mrs. Raisin, are you sure this is where you left him? This is definitely the place. It looks like he got fed up of waiting. He's tied his handkerchief here to mark the spot. Give me that a handkerchief. I shall use it to throttle him. Anyway, the bottle's just down there. Whereabouts? In the ditch. And try not to fall in. All oh, right, I can see it. And? That little bottle is what is commonly known as Newcastle Brown Ale. But it was a medicine bottle. I saw it with my own eyes. Well, maybe it's time you got down to the opticians. <sighs> Don't worry, Mrs. Raisin. It's an easy enough mistake to make. What the hell do you think you were doing? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Raisin. Do come in. I told you to stay put until the police got there. You know, until I moved to this village, I really believed in the concept of free will. And will you turn off that racket? That so-called racket is the greatest composer who ever lived. Oh, thank you so much for turning off my stereo. I find it so hard to manage those little buttons. And by all means, do have a seat. Oh, do you mind if I smoke? You can do anything you like if it shortens your life expectancy. Our one chance of proving it was murder. And you not only abandon the evidence, you leave a helpful little sign so the killer can come back and dispose of it properly. I had no intention of freezing to death just so you could prove your crackpot theory. And do you mind not flicking ash on my aspidistra? Oh, sod your aspidistra. When we found your carefully knotted handkerchief, the bottle of poison was not only gone, it had been replaced by a bottle of beer. Oh. Precisely. Oh. So, whoever did that must have guessed that we were on their tail. The sheer brilliance of the military mind never ceases to amaze me. Now, let's go through the facts. First... Paul Bladen is killed. Well, that's debatable. Then Mrs. Joseph says she knows his secret, and by the next day she's dead too. Uh, do you have a black sweater? 
There's one thing I love, it's a non sequitur. And you'll need black shoes, black trousers, and if possible, a balaclava. Whatever for? We're going to break into Paul Bladen's house. Managed to remove one of the hinge pins. Take your time. No one can see us. Will you just remind me how you persuaded me to do this? Was it hypnosis? Did you slip a, a capsule or something into my gin and tonic? James, you're doing this because deep down you know it's the right thing to do. Yeah, so breaking into someone's house is an act of moral virtue, is it? I obviously wasn't paying attention in my religious education classes. Ah, right. That's it. Last. Now give me the torch. Are you sure this place is empty? He lived on his own. To the best of my knowledge, the only family was his brother, and he lives on the other side of Evesham. I don't have to make so much mess. How am I going to find anything if I don't empty the drawers? The estate agents can tidy up. Let those parasites earn their exorbitant fees. And what are the estate agents reported as a burglary? Don't you read the papers? The police don't solve crime nowadays. They just offer victim support. James, look. What do you make of this? It's a betting slip. There are two drawers full of them. Uh, let me see. This is Joseph's dog. Two milligrams of Domitor administered. Odds, survival, five to one. Instant death, three to two. Comatose, five to four. Oh. Mrs. Joseph's dog. Paul was a vet, and he took bets on whether animals would live or die. The question is, who was he betting with? Well, I hardly think he arranged it with Labbrooks. No. It must all have been carried out in secret, like badger baiting or cockfighting. Oh, no, this is interesting. What is it? Some kind of list. Miss Sims, £500. Frida Huntingdon, £5,000. Agatha Raisin? Question mark. Oh, dear. Uh... When I spent an evening with Paul, he told me he wanted to set up a veterinary hospital. You spent an evening with him? It's a free country. Yes, fine, yes. Why would not? Yes. And at the end of the evening, he asked for a donation. Uh, a donation? What sort of an evening was it? A donation for his veterinary hospital. Hmm. Not that there was ever going to be a hospital. I imagine not. It looks as though he needed every penny for his gambling debts. The strange thing is, I went home early that evening. He wanted me to stay for a nightcap, but... Uh, I, I changed my mind. But I phoned to thank him for the meal, and a woman answered, said she was his wife. You didn't mention a wife. I, I thought you said his brother was the only relative. No, oh, he wasn't married. But I have a fairly shrewd idea. It was your friend, Frida Huntingdon. Hmm. So you slipped out into the night, and he phoned Frida. And she was prepared to drop everything for him. That's one way of putting it. Hmm. But the one thing that doesn't make sense to me... Yes? If he was trying to con money out of people, why on earth would he kill their pets? Well, a single woman with a cat, she loses her pet, becomes very vulnerable. And it's so much easier for Paul to move in and be sympathetic. And then maybe the best way to pay tribute to that much-loved animal is um, just a small donation to my hospital. Oh, that reminds me. Chivers hasn't been fed. We'd best get back. Just one thing, though. If he conned money out of all these people, why did they call him a miracle worker? It was only Mrs. Joseph who, who turned against him. Oh, that's easy. You like opera, don't you? Oh, well, well, I like the old stuff, but I do draw the line at Benjamin Britten. I mean, all those sailors and fishermen and fairies and the Yes, wood yes, and yes, all right. Anyway, if you went to see oof, Aida and it was all done in modern dress and set on a building site in Wolverhampton, what would you tell people afterwards? I'd say the English National Opera has a lot to answer for. Yes, yes, but you've just paid £100 for a load of rubbish and that makes you an idiot. So you might say it was innovative, challenging, <sighs> ahead of its time. Anything but admit you were wrong. So all these women were waxing lyrical about the vet. Because he screwed them for every penny they had, right? <sighs> Let's get back before my cat starts eating the wallpaper. Oh, dear... Well, I'm too old for this. If God had meant us to be out this late, he wouldn't have invented Horlicks. Will you stop whinging and learn to live a little? Did you ever speak to the brother? Ah, uh, I tried to. At Paul's funeral, but he didn't want to know. I think he loathed his brother. So what have we got? Two brothers, both vets. Who don't get on at all. One named Peter and one named Paul. James, look. There's a policeman down there. 
Where? At the other end of the lane. I think he's coming towards us. What on earth is he going to think? It's two o'clock in the morning. Uh, pretend we're lovers. What? What else would we be doing in a country lane in the middle of the night? Uh, badger watching. Do I really look the type? No, um, fair point. Uh, yes. Uh, Put well, your arms around me. Look, is this absolutely essential? Uh, do you want to spend the night in a police cell? No, right. Uh, where do I put my arms? Uh, up here? A little bit lower. Good Lord. Kiss me. No, I really do think that's quite unnatural. Oh, oh, oh. Kiss me again. Well, I suppose if it does add to the overall verisimilitude, then I may as well. Just keep in this position. Don't move. Stay very, very close. Agatha, please, can you stick to the passenger seat or you'll set off the... Horn. Quiet. He's looking in. Oh, dear. He's gone. Thank goodness for that. You don't need to sound quite so relieved. Right. Well, if the coast is clear, home, James, and don't spare the horses. Well, I think you did that rather well for a beginner. Mrs. Rayson, there are some things in life one doesn't wish to be given marks out of ten for. Pity. I would have put you down for at least 7.5. Do you know, when that policeman went past, I was almost inclined to give myself up and get arrested. At least that sort of thing wouldn't happen to me in prison. You really have led a sheltered life, James, haven't you? pour you some more tea, Mrs. Raisin. What makes you quite so sure she was abducted? Because Chivers can't open doors. I'm sorry to take it out on you, Mrs. Bloxby, but it's all been such a shock. Oh, don't worry, my dear. There's quite a search party out looking for her. Mrs. Mason, Mrs. Harvey from the village shop. Oh, and I even saw James Lacey on his knees with a tin of tuna fish, which was quite a sight, I can tell you. Before <laughs> I got Chivers, I didn't know you could worry so much about another creature. Oh, I wish I could go back to being selfish. Oh, you don't mean that. Now, I knew you wouldn't be in the mood for eating much, but I have brought along a very nice pineapple upside down cake. Thanks, Mrs. Bloxby. I'll have a cigarette, if you don't mind. Oh, well, if it helps you relax. Oof. I seem to be the last smoker left on this planet. One day they're going to round me up and shoot me for it. So until then, I've just got to cram in as many as I can manage. You know, Mrs. Raisin, at times like this, I'm really glad I live in a village. I mean, everyone's turned out to help. I've got the whole of the Castle Ladies Society combing people's gardens. Oh, all except Frida Huntington. Well, she's never liked my cat or me, come to think of it. Oh, no, she's far too busy with her new gentleman friend. I think she said they were going into Evesham. Do you know who this old flame is? Oh, it's Mr. Bladen. Don't you know? Paul Bladen is dead. No, 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 the other one, the brother, Peter. Apparently they had a relationship some years ago, but Frida broke it off. Then they met again at the funeral, and although it seems a strange place to find romance, somehow the flame was rekindled. Mrs. Bloxby, do you mind? I have to go somewhere. Oh, is something the matter? I think I know where my cat is. You've reached the answer phone of James Lacey. Sorry, I'm not available at the moment, but please do leave a message. James, where are you? Oh, sorry, I know. You're looking for chivers. It's eight o'clock in the evening and I'm in Evesham. I'm about to break into Peter Bladen's surgery. If I'm not back by ten o'clock, then will you please... For well, Frida, how's your foie gras? Oh, delectable. <laughs> Oh, Peter, I'm so glad to be back with you. You're on the side of the angels. And I've spent so long with little devils. Like my brother. Oh, poor Paul. He was such a dreamer, but he meant well. That's one way of looking at it. Did you know I put £5,000 in a fund for his veterinary hospital? You and God knows how many others. He was like a black hole. People kept giving him money, but he still died in debt. Is there any way I could get it back, do you think? We'll see. When the sale of the house comes through and I've paid off his debts. Thanks. Do you know there are still people in the village believe he was murdered? Oh, there's villages for you. 
In a city, your next-door neighbour could be a serial killer and you'd turn a blind eye, wouldn't want to get involved. <laughs> you'd be lucky if you knew your neighbour's name. <laughs> yes, right. But in a village, someone dies and everyone's gossiping. It's got to be murder. Yes. Though it didn't help Mrs Joseph's going so soon afterwards. I told you Mrs Raisin was convinced she'd found poison in the woods. Yes. Uh, hopefully she'll be too busy looking for a cat to do any more snooping. More wine. Peter. Yeah? How did you know about Agatha's cat? I saw the search party on my way here. I thought you came here straight from work. Please, don't give me the third degree. It's been a rough few days and I just wanted a nice quiet evening. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Now, if you don't mind, I've got a few things to check on my surgery and I really need an early night. Peter, no, don't go, please. He hasn't hurt you. Come on, come on, you're safe now. Well, well, well. <gasps> Our very own Miss Marple. Peter, so you're a kidnapper on top of everything else. Stand back, up against the wall. You wouldn't dare touch me. I think I would. Do you know what's in this bottle? I imagine you're going to tell me. Immobilon. A syringe full of this can knock out a horse, so just imagine what it does to a human. Like your dearly departed brother. Was he human? You could have fooled me. Stay away from me. The police are already on their way, so don't make things worse. Oh, they're on their way, are they? They just sent you on ahead. I left a message with them. I told them what you did to Paul and Mrs Josephs. This little message of yours. Did you mention what Paul did to me when we were in partnership? The thousands of pounds of debt, the theft, the lies. He bankrupted me. It is still not worth taking a life for. I didn't take his life for that. When I found out he'd robbed me, I sent him to Carsley. I told him, get my money back by any means possible. Well, you should be proud of him. He did his best to swindle me. Well, you can afford it. And if he spent the night with you, I think he earned it. But then he moved on to Frida, the only woman I had loved. And there are some people too precious to be wounded, to be hurt. So you killed him for that? I'm a vet, Mrs Raisin. My job is to remove cancerous tissue. And that's what I did with Paul. He was your brother. We're not the first. Do you know why Cain killed Abel? Because Abel was the pretty one, the one who always got his own way. Look, what he's done is done. And if you let me and Chivers go, I'll say no more about it and you and Frida can start all over again. So the police aren't on their way then. Well, that makes things a lot easier. 200 milligrams, that should do the trick. Go on, Chivers. Go, go, come on, all of you, let's get out of Leave here. Leave those animals alone. No, we're all getting out of here. Peter Bladen, I'm arresting you on two charges of murder and one attempted murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Agatha, not much Agatha are you all right? James, I have never been so pleased to see anyone in my life. This way, Mr Bladen. I got your message. In future, will you please leave the heroics to people who are suitably qualified? James, there are some things in life which are too important to leave to the professionals. Thank God you're alive. Oh. Let's get these animals somewhere safe. Oh, and so DC Wong took Mr. Bladen into custody, and I got Chippers back, safe and sound. Oh, oh. Mrs. Raisin, thank you so much. What an amazing story. Wow. Uh, well, ladies, ladies, uh, unfortunately, we've had to postpone Mrs. Mason's Turkish belly dancer yet again. Oh. But don't, don't worry, Mrs. Mason, I'm sure we'll get round to you next week. Oh, oh and may I just thank everyone for the search party? Peter Bladen didn't stand a chance against the women of Castle. Oh, don't mention it, Mrs. Raisin. <laughs> It's always nice to have a poke about in other people's gardens. Hey, <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Mason. Uh, just one thing, though. Yes? Now, I enjoyed your story. In particular, the bit where you pinned Peter against the wall, you shoved his hands in the filing cabinet, and you held him tight till the police got there. Well, it's astonishing what you can do when adrenaline kicks in. Oh, I discovered that in my karate classes. So then, are you planning to sue the police? Because they're insisting they overpowered him. Well... We all have our interpretation of events. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Mason. Uh, well, I don't know about you ladies, but I think Mrs. Raisin should form her very own detective agency. Maybe with Mr. Lacey alongside you. Oh, like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Or that Poirot and Mrs. Marble. Oh, yes. my, my favourite was always Emma Peel and Mr. Steed. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Bloxby. I'm working on it.
In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy and DC Wong by Ben Crow, with Ewan Bailey as Peter Bladen and Jilly Mears as Frieda. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, it's so kind of you to take our old folk out for the day. Mr. and Mrs. Boggle can't get about as much as they used to, so they'll be so happy to take advantage. Mrs. Bloxby, it's a pleasure. I'm always happy to help someone less fortunate than myself. Oh, careful! You're not much of a driver, are you, Mrs. Raisin? No! That's three near misses in the past half hour! I am doing my best, Mrs. Boggle. I am not familiar with Bristol's ridiculous one-way system. Well, Mrs. Fortune never had no trouble, did she, Bardo? No, Mrs. Fortune never complained. If Mrs. Fortune is so magnanimous, where is she now? She's a very busy woman. Yes, uh, can't always manage to take us. No, she's probably up in the trees teaching baby birds how to fly. Right, Mrs. Raisin, pull over. Why? I need to spend a penny in them bushes. Mrs. Boggle, I was prepared to be your chauffeur, your skivvy and your banker, but I draw the line at lavatory attendant. Well, it serves you right for dragging us away from them tea rooms so fast. You won't be doing that again in a hurry. That is correct, because I will not be taking you out again. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, why ever not? Because first thing tomorrow morning, I am going to sell up and move back to London. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 3. The Potted Gardener. Agatha! James! Oh, you made me jump. I'm sorry, didn't mean to. I've just been doing a spot of gardening. Thought I'd pop over and see how you were getting on with yours. Getting on fine with my garden. I stand in it, have a smoke. It provides me with weeds to look at. Agatha, you really ought to do something with it. You're letting it go to ruin. Life's too short to mow the lawn. Besides, it'll only grow back again in six months. You should join the Carsley Horticultural Society. It's awfully good fun. Oh, yes. Discussing the Latin name for a Michaelmas daisy. That does sound fun. Anyway, if you think the garden's bad, you should see the house. I can't get a cleaner for love nor money. Good Lord, you... Don't tell me you're actually having to get down on your knees and do it yourself, are you? Don't you start. <laughs> I've had a very trying day, chauffeuring the boggles. Oh, it was your turn this week. How was it for you? Absolute hell. Oh. But at least now, I know where I stand on euthanasia. Mm. Mrs Bloxby wrote me into it last week. By about two o'clock, I was so desperate to get home, I actually faked an angina attack. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, that's, that's my front door. I didn't hear anything. Oh, it's Mary Fortune. Mary, I I'm over here in Agatha's. The divine Mrs. Fortune. Yes, do invite your guests into my garden, please. James, darling. <coughs> Hello, Agatha. Mrs. Fortune. James, I've brought you some fuchsia cuttings. Oh, excellent. What variety? There's moon glow, bouffant, and baby blue eyes. I'm experimenting with Galahad this year. Marvellous pale Corolla. Oh, that is exciting. We can do swapses. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Raisin, this is an interesting garden. I see you've gone for the wilderness look. Yes, and it's taken a lot of work to achieve this effect. And what are those chippings in all the beds? Is it some kind of organic mulch? No, they're my cigarette butts. Oh, well, I'm sure this sort of garden is very eco-friendly. Weeds make such a good habitat for moths. Oh, come now, Mary, even moths have standards. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it must be so frustrating for you, James, when the seeds blow into your garden. Still, I suppose at a certain age it's tempting to just let everything go. At least in my case, I had something to let go of. It, Agatha was just saying how hard it is to find a cleaning lady. Oh, I know. I am so lucky. Doris Simpson does for me. She's such a treasure. But I don't think she'd have time for your place. I do keep her busy. We'll see about that. Treasure has a way of changing hands. Right, then. I think these fuchsia cuttings need to be potted on. Uh, are you coming with us, Agatha? No, thank you. I've just remembered I've got some wet paint and I want to watch it drying. Good evening. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> don't you find camellias an absolute joy?
Hello. Doris Simpson? Yes, that's right. Good evening. My name is Agatha Raisin. Now, I understand you do cleaning. Well, I do, but I don't see as how I could manage any more, and that's a fact. Mondays is Mrs Chumley, Tuesdays Mrs Barr, Wednesdays Mrs Fortune, Thursdays... How much Mrs. does she pay you? Who, Mrs Fortune? Yes, just out of interest. Three pounds an hour. That's slave labour. Come to me and uh, I'll give you five. Well, I don't know if I can. And sick pay. Well, that's very generous. And seven weeks holiday. Well, I don't think Mrs Fortune would be too happy. No, I don't suppose she will be. Mrs Raisin, how dare you? Ah, Mrs Fortune. Lovely evening. I have spent months building up a relationship with my cleaner. Oh, I see. Paying someone peanuts, never giving them time off, and following them round the house tutting. That's a relationship, is it? Fine. You can keep, Doris. I hope you're very happy together. But I'm having James Lacey. Well, everybody, thank you for coming. This is an all-time record for the Carsley Horticultural Society. Yes, we're spreading like the fronds on a Dixonia fibrosa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Reason, over here. Hello, Mrs. Bloxby. Now, tonight is a very special night for us. Mrs. Fortune will present an illustrated lecture entitled The Gardens of California. And to celebrate the occasion... Mrs. Bloxby has baked some Californian-style chocolate chip cookies. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, they're just on the table. Do help yourself. Now, I have to set up the slide projector, so do feel free to stretch your legs for a few minutes. Ah. This is great. I didn't know you had green fingers. There's a lot of people around here don't know about me. Why does everyone think of me as some kind of townie? Well, this lecture should be interesting. Mrs. Fortune spent quite a few years in California before she came to our little village. Mm. That must be where she got her facelift. Oh, Mrs. Fortune, do you know Mrs. Raisin? How lovely to see you, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, mwah, oh, mwah. Heavens, we're going all continental this evening. Yes, I have met Mrs. Raisin. Uh, we were just discussing your time in California, Mrs. Fortune. It must be quite a culture shock going from somewhere that's the heart of the film industry to a place with just one video rental shop. Oh, no, it's an absolute joy. Towards the end of my time in California, I grew so tired of actors and models and glamorous people. Really, I'd far rather be with people like you. Oh, that's so kind. Well, I must go and hand out my glamorous cookies. <laughs> oh, look, it's darling James. Mwah, mwah. Uh, don't make me drop my seedlings, Mary. <laughs> I was going to give you some of these. Oh, super. I've got some too. We can do swapsies again. Excuse me, Mrs Fortune. Could you just come and check the slides are in the correct order? Dear Bernard, mwah, mwah. isn't this man a treasure? He runs the Horticultural Society, he organises meals on wheels, the Boy Scouts. Well, there's no point sitting at home moping, is there? <laughs> oh, you're so modest. But really, you are an incredible man. You're such a doer. Now, let's sort out these slides, then, shall we? You're very kind, Mrs Fortune, but really, I'm just an ordinary man. Wonderfully flamboyant you. character, oh, Mary. James, that woman snares men the way a Venus flytrap snares insects. Look at the way she's flirting with Bernard Halitosis' breath. She's just rather vivacious, that's all. She collects men like little potted seedlings. Probably keeps them in her greenhouse with a name tag on their ankles. Beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. I am not <laughs> jealous. <laughs> Right, I am off to fill my face with chocolate chip cookies. Fine, and I shall go and sit next to someone a little less censorious. <sighs> Chivers, please. That is a puddle, not a drinking fountain. Agatha! James, I thought you'd be over at Mary's, examining her seedlings, doing some swapsies, going to the shopsies, eating pork chopsies. There's no need to take that turn. I thought, now that you're taking an interest in gardening, I could uh, come round and give you some tips. Oh, I see. Unwanted horticultural advice. What are you, a Jehovah's gardener? Now, look, your soil is absolutely sodden. It hasn't seen a hoe since the relief of Mafeking. As recently as that? But with a bit of vigorous digging. Oh, oh, God. Oh, oh. What's the matter? 
Have you stabbed yourself in the foot? So, I, I can't get out of this position. Well, it serves you right for sticking your fork in where it isn't wanted. Agatha, please. I'm in agony. Let's get you into the house. Oh. At least you can be in agony on a comfy oh. sofa. Oh. 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 Come on in. Uh, can you sit down? Good Lord, I can hardly lift up my head to see which way I'm... Ah. Sorry. Going. Oh. What oh. exactly is the matter with you? Well... My back's giving me hell, but I've got this lump right here in my abdomen. Let's have a look. It's just here. Take your shirt off. Oh, I don't think that's really necessary. Well, you don't expect me to examine it by Braille, do you? Oh, fair enough. I suppose you're right. Take it right off. Oh, oh very well. Oh, look. Here it is. It's the size of a golf ball. Do you think it could be a hernia? That's possible. I'm assuming you didn't get peckish on a golf course. Um, can I have my shirt back, please? Oh, hold on. I'll just get that. Oh, I can... I'm, uh... Aggie, it's me. Surprise, surprise. Roy, what are you doing here? Well, there's no need to sound quite so underwhelmed. Oh, hello. Good evening. <laughs> Roy, there is a reason I've got a half-naked man in my living room. I'm sure there is. My name is James. I'm from next door, and uh, my back just gave out, and Agatha was taking a look, and so I... I Do really you think should... it's lumbago? Uh, no, no, what? No, I, I suppose it could be. I, I don't think it's... Because uh... I could give you a massage. I'm an absolute wizard, she had so... No, no, thank you. I, I really must stare back to my cottage, um, house, and, um... James, let me come with you. No, no, I think I can manage 45 <laughs> yards. Ooh. I'll pop round later. Thank you. Oh, here's your shirt. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Right, why didn't you phone to say you were coming? Because someone's been leaving her phone off the hook. Oh, yes. I've been getting abusive phone calls. I kidnapped someone's cleaning lady. It's a long story. Well, it's not as long as the tale of woe that I'm about to tell. Oh, dear. Shall I pour some gin and we can drown our sorrows? Oh, sweetie. There isn't enough gin in the world. So, how are things in PR? I don't do PR anymore. Your Mr Pedman has given me the old heave-ho. No. I said if he wanted the company, he had to keep on my staff. Well, he did keep me on, but we had a bit of a contretemps. Oh, Roy. It was all to do with the British Legion poppy appeal. Now, we needed a top celeb to wear a poppy on their chest, and thinking chests, I naturally came up with Jordan. Oh, no. But Pedman insisted on using June Whitfield. Thank goodness. So, since he didn't understand my vision, I got some photos of his face, put them on the body of a porn star and posted them all over the internet. That is appalling. No, it was quite nice, actually. I printed you out a couple of copies. You really shouldn't have. Oh. So, here I am, 21 years old and on the scrap heap. Your 21st birthday is a dim and distant memory. Oh, between you, me and the lamppost. But I'm hoping if I knock a few years off, I won't be on the scrap heap for quite so long. Oh, hello, Chivers. Come to join us. Oh, you've still got the flea bag. Don't be so jealous. Now I shall make you up the spare bed. Oh, I need an early night. Oh, something exciting in the morning. The highlight of my humdrum life. Wednesday's the day we put the wheelie bins out. More gin? Oh, oh. morning, Agatha. James, how are you? Well, uh, I've been to the doctor and um, it's not good. Roy, I've got wonderful news. How do you like your sausages? Crisp, charcoal or burnt to a frazzle? Never mind about that. Just listen. James Lacey has a suspected abdominal hernia. And the good news? That is the good news. Oh, abdominal hernia. Oh, bring on the champagne and the dancing girls. No, no, no. The point is, in a month's time, we're having the Carsley Garden Festival. We all open our gardens up for charity and vote for our favourite. Oh, one sausage or two? Three, please. Now... James was an absolute dead cert to win, but if he has to give up gardening, I'm in with a chance. Aggie, 
how can I put this? A garden is a delicate thing. It needs love. It's not like people where you can just shout at them. I can do caring and nurturing. These sausages are vile. No, there's one simple way to win this competition. And that is? Buy everything from a garden centre. Pop there the day before, have everything installed overnight, and hey presto, instant garden. No frost damage, leaf rot, or mealy worm infestation. Aggie, I hate to bring up the past, but don't you remember last year? You cheated in a quiche competition and the judge popped his clogs. Well, that's not going to happen again, is it? The judge isn't likely to nibble my deadly nightshade, is he? Well, there is the small matter of your next-door neighbours. I mean, won't they be a teensy bit suspicious when this magic garden suddenly appears? I thought of that. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to build a ten-foot-high fence... No one will see into the garden for the next six weeks except for you and me. Oh, lovely. Checkpoint Charlie comes to the Cotswolds. Now, when can you start? Sorry, start what? You're my horticultural consultant. I mean, you're not working, so I need a ten-foot-high cedar wood fence and an aerial plan of my prize-winning garden. Aggie, I don't know the difference between a herbaceous border and a sebaceous cyst. Right, where's my checkbook? Aggie... I am incorruptible. I will play no part in this web of horticultural iniquity. Will this change your mind? Right. What would you prefer, water feature or decking? Morning, Mrs Raisin. Ah, oh, Bernard. Mrs Fortune, come to give me some tips? I'm just wondering if you have planning permission for this alteration. It's only going up until open day. I'm sure it contravenes planning regulations. What do you think, Mary? Well, I really don't see how your plants are going to get any light. Mrs Fortune, I've worked in public relations, show business really, and we always believe in keeping an audience in suspense, so when the 7th of June arrives, I can promise you something quite spectacular. What a particularly vulgar woman that Mrs Raisin is. Let's not talk about her, Bernard, darling. You promised to look at my conservatory. Oh, yes, of course. You mentioned that you've picked up some interesting propagating techniques in California. Oh, I pick up techniques wherever I go. Goodness. How did you get planning permission for this? Mm, I had to pull quite a few strings with the council. Now, Bernard, do take your coat off. It does get rather steamy. Yeah. It's like the Garden of Eden. Mm. Why don't you try some fruit? At this time of year. Morello cherry, the first of the season. Mm. A little too tart for my liking. Oh, mind you don't get juice down your shirt. Thank you. That's a very powerful humidifier. My seedlings like the atmosphere to be moist. I've never used a humidifier, but uh, I always feel if you can keep consistent atmospheric conditions, then your plants... Has anyone ever told you you're a very attractive man? Uh, no. They haven't, actually. Well, it's true. You're so boyish, so full of energy. Well, I try to keep fit. I would say I'm every bit as athletic as I was when I was 21. Oh, I'm sure you are. But why don't you show me? Mrs. Fortune. Please call me Mary. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. And you join us today on Gardener's Question Time from the potting shed here in Sparshalt. We've got the... Mrs. Bloxley. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. May I come in? Of course. Oh, thank you. Look as if you've seen a ghost. I've seen something much worse. Goodness. I would offer you a cigarette, but I know you're far too clean living. Oh, that's all right. I just need to get my breath back. Take your time. Now, sit down. Tell me oh. what happened. Well, I was taking an early morning walk around the village today, and I saw Mr and Mrs Boggle leaning on their garden gate. They didn't ask for a day trip, did they? Uh, no, 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 no. They, they were very upset. Someone had been into their garden in the night, taken their garden gnomes and chopped their heads off. Well, they do live very close to the Red Lion, and it can get a bit rough on a Friday night. Well, yes, that was my first thought, but then I just popped into James Lacey. James? Yes, yes, he, he's got some beautiful white roses. He really thought they were prize winners. 
but someone went into his garden last night and spray-painted them black. Well, perhaps it's a practical joke. If it is, it's a very cruel one. Then I saw Bernard Spot. He was standing on his front lawn in floods of tears. What happened to him? Someone poured weed killer in his goldfish pond. You could see all the poor dead fish floating on the surface. That is appalling, but surely it was just someone who'd had a bit too much to drink. I don't think so. I think something terrible is happening in the village. Right, Mrs. Raisin, I've hoovered your carpets and I've dusted all of downstairs. Doris, you are worth your weight in gold. But there's something I wanted to ask you. Far away. Can't I take those Venetian blinds down and give the windows a proper polish? Absolutely not. No one is allowed to see into my garden except my horticultural assistant, Roy. Uh, Mrs. Raisin, I don't mean to speak out of turn, but... This garden festival, it's only meant to be a bit of fun. Precisely. And if you open your presents six weeks before Christmas, that spoils the fun. If you ask me, the whole thing has got out of hand. And now we've got some lunatic cutting the heads off innocent garden gnomes. Doris, that's got absolutely nothing to do with me. Oh, no, no, Mrs Raisin. No, 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 no. I wasn't accusing you. Now... I'm not one to gossip, but if I had to lay money on it, I'd go for that merry fortune. Doris, that's a terrible thing to say. Do go on. Well, she's one of those people, all nice and smiley on the outside, but you look at her face. There's something there you can't quite trust. Well, the surgeons did their best, but they couldn't remove all traces of personality. Surgeons? What are you talking about? Didn't you know? When she was in California, she had a bit of a nip and tuck. That woman's never been to California in her life. Before she came here, she was living in Sully Hull. Sully Hull, my word. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the same ring as Beverly Hills. What made her leave? Not that it was much of a wrench. Well, she had a very nasty divorce, my dear. Husband left her for someone half her age. The usual empty-headed bimbo, I suppose. Actually, no. It was a pizza delivery boy from Wolverhampton. If you ask me, that's why she's quite so keen on chasing men. Just so she knows she can still work her old charms on them. Uh, uh, Doris, would you mind getting that, please? Will do. Afternoon, Doris. Mrs Raisin about. Oh, Constable Wong. Yes, I'll just give her a call. Mrs Raisin, police gentleman for you. Ah, the old Bill. Or rather, the young Bill. Uh, Doris, can you do the back bedroom, please? Yes, Mrs Raisin. Come in, Bill, please. Thank you. What have I done now? Nothing, I hope. But what with all this vandalism, I'm having to look in everyone's back garden. Bill, it's really not convenient. I'm doing a lot uh, of work. I cannot my... show favouritism. So if you could just open your back door, please. Can you keep a secret? That depends on how wicked this secret might be. Well, you're about to find out. Oh, blow me. Someone's stolen your garden. I've been doing a bit of digging. Chivers, get out of the mud. There's nothing left. It's like the craters of the moon. Well, it isn't finished yet. <laughs> I should hope not. You won't win any prizes with this. We don't go for avant-garde in the Cotswolds. Well, I was going to add a few things. I'm sending a lorry down to the garden centre the night before the competition. Oh, no. She's gone back to the dark side. Well, it's not the worst thing in the world. I am gardening. I'm just using a credit card instead of a trowel. Agatha, what is it with you? Just when you seem to be settling in, just when you seem to be part of the scenery... You have to pull off a stunt like this to get one over on people. Bill, I try to do things properly. I bake little cakes. I take old people for rides in the countryside. But something in me just needs to win things. Oh, well. At least I can tell the boss you haven't got the Boggles gnomes. In this great big pit, there's no way you could hide them. Hello? We're here, and we've got your secret garden. Oh, what time is it? Two o'clock in the morning. Can we start unloading? Uh, I'll, I'll be down in a minute, but don't make too much noise. Oh, 
we wouldn't dare. There's a breathless ash down in Lilac Lane. Agatha Raisin is cheating again. With azaleas on the left. Now over here, my particular pride and joy. Free Montedendron Californicum. Mrs. Raisin, that is most certainly not Free Montedendron. It's very clearly a Figelius Capensis. You don't know what you're talking about. Now, over here... Agatha, when did you plant out these begonias? The last week in April. Goodness. So did I, but mine died of ground frost the first week of May. Beginner's luck. Now, over here, a lovely example of hydrangea. Hydrangea? Hydrangeas have veins on their leaves, and the flowers are in clusters. This is, in fact, a Robinia pseudoacacia called Frisia. Anyone like some tea? Oh, this is raisin. What a beautiful garden. It's like something from a fairy tale. Indeed, it is quite beyond belief. Oh, hello, Bernard. Oh, Mr. Lacey. How was your operation? Went rather well, but uh, it'll be a long time before I do any weightlifting. Oh. Um, has anyone seen Mrs. Fortune? She put so much effort into her garden, I thought she'd be doing the rounds. I haven't seen her for weeks. Well, let's pop round, shall we, Bernard? Thank you for rescuing me, Mrs. Bloxby. Well, I was coming up the garden path, and Mr. Spot did seem to be going for your jugular somewhat. Well, he's noticed quite a lot of this garden didn't actually grow here. Old habits die hard, Mrs. Raisin. <laughs> I'm off to Mary's now. Congratulate her on winning first prize. <laughs> Mary? Mary? Mr. Lacey, I really feel we should come back later. This is somebody else's property. Bernard, look around. Someone's been here before us. How'd you come to that conclusion? For God's sake, look. These plants look as though they've been hacked up with a with a machete. Well, it won't win any prizes for topiary, but I really feel it's none of our business. Here she comes now. Oh, Mary. Oh. It's you. Thank you, James. I do like a nice warm welcome. What happened here? Looks as if our mysterious garden vandal has struck again. James, what's in that terracotta pot? Hmm. Judging by the shape, it's some variety of palm. Dixonia fibrosa? But why has she wrapped it up in a bin liner? I really feel we should leave now and put the matter in the hands of the police. I'm going to open it. Oh, no. Agatha, Agatha, please don't. It, it, it... It's Mary. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Roy was played by David Holt, Bernard Spot by Paul Brooke and Mary Fortune by Sally Grace. Liza Sadovy was Mrs. Bloxby and Ben Crow was DC Wong. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton Dramatised for radio by David Semple Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha Episode 4 the Gardener's Legacy. Hello. Hi, Aggie. Just calling to ask how you got on at the Garden Festival. Oh, Roy. Well, were they wowed by your wisteria? Did your peonies win prizes? Did your nasturtiums knock them dead? <laughs> You've been practising that all week, haven't you? <laughs> it's a gift. Well, the Garden Festival didn't go exactly as planned. Do you remember Mary Fortune, the woman with the Gucci shoes and the matching facelift? Oh, yes, I remember her. She reminded me of the scream by Edvard Munch. She's dead. No. James and I found the body. Whoever killed her, wrapped her up in a bin liner, buried her head in a terracotta pot and tied her ankles to a hanging basket. That's awful. Anyway, how did you do in the competition? Roy, did you hear what I just said? A woman was killed. Whether I won any prizes or not isn't really relevant. You came second, then? Thanks to you, I was disqualified. Oh, Aggie, what happened? Did they see the van from the garden centre? 
those little labels you put on, Fremontidendron rhubarbia or whatever, they were all attached to the wrong plants. No, that's not my fault. I told Gary to put them on from left to right. It was all written on a piece of paper. Well, it doesn't matter anymore, does it? Are you still coming up this weekend? Well, I'm not sure. Every time I visit, someone seems to drop down dead. Yes, well, it's a small village. It's not likely to happen every week. Uh, fair enough. Well, in that case, I should be round on Friday with a chocolate fudge cake and a bottle of Bombay Sapphire. <laughs> well, I've got to go now. I'm seeing the police this morning. Oh, dear. You're not going to confess to the whole grisly murder, are you? Can I get you a cup of tea, Mrs Raisin? No, thanks. I think DC Wong is calling me back in a second. righty old Agatha. So they've been interrogating you too, have they? Yes, James, for the past two hours. I'm beginning to wonder, are they investigating her murder or turning her life into a musical? Well, I've had it up to here with the whole business. It has not been the best week of my life. First, there was the hernia operation, prodded and poked by a team of doctors, one of whom appeared to be eating a tuna sandwich. Oh, I forgot to ask, how did that go? Well, they, they put back all the bits that came out. I just hope it's not the start of a slippery slope. I expect my internal organs to stay put and wait for their orders. Look, at a certain age, you really have to start listening to your body because it certainly doesn't listen to you. I do not take lessons on health matters from someone who smokes like a dark satanic mill. Anyway, all that surgery was nothing compared to the ordeal I've just been through. They didn't throw you down the stairs to get a confession, did they? No, I could handle that. But I've been asked the most impertinent questions by young men who do not appear to have started shaving yet. Don't tell me the policemen seem much younger these days. Everyone looks younger these days. Even the Dalai Lama has a spring in his step. Well, one thing about being a certain age, at least they're less likely to suspect you of murder. I mean, you didn't hoist Mary up and bury her head like that two days after a hernia operation. Well, have you know, with modern surgery, in less than 24 hours, you can be swimming, cycling, jogging and presumably killing people. Really? I'm amazed they don't put that in their brochure. Right, you two. Would you both come down to my office, please? Oh, dear. I think this is the bit where he tells us to keep out of this investigation. And leave it to people who've only just given up their paper rounds. Now, first things first. There are tabloid journalists all over the village. And I probably know each and every one of them. I was in PR for 30 years, remember? I've eaten most journalists for breakfast. Well, in that case, you want to go home, don't answer the door, and take the phone off the hook. I don't want you talking to them. Bill, I can handle the press. I know how to speak the language of reptiles. Well, you're not doing your Dr. Doolittle routine this time. I do not want to read according to James Lacey, or according to Mrs. Raisin, or according to an unnamed source with a cat named Chivers. Now, hold on. I thought you chaps used the press as your main line of attack. I mean, how are you going to get information if you don't have appeals for witnesses? Mr Lacey, we use the press, not you. That way we can control it and any dangerous rumours get knocked on the head. With respect, Bill, you have as much control of the press as David Attenborough has over herds of rampaging wildebeest. Uh, phone call for you, Bill. Uh, whoever it is, tell him I'll talk to him later. Right up. And another thing. Yes. I do not want you two sticking your noses in. Whoever did this is extremely dangerous. Well, whoever did this is unlikely to live in this village. I mean, a killer picked her up like a sack of potatoes. I can't visualise someone from the Carsley Lady Society doing that. Mrs Mason could probably manage it. We are currently following all lines of inquiry. And until this case is solved, you are not to talk to anyone about it. Understood? Yes, I, I think that's a reasonable request. Agatha? My lips are sealed. I'm glad to hear it. In the past, I've been very grateful for your help, but this time I... Re Bill, it's the chief constable on the line, and he really won't hold. All right, you two. I'll just be a second. Right, James, who should we talk to first? Well, Bernard Spot seems quite promising. I mean, he was rather close to Mary. I want to save him for later. How about the Boggles? What about the coffee shop? Can you read my letter? Oh, Liza. Look who's here. Oh, it's you two, is it? I'm mean, watching neighbours on the telly, so you'll just have to wait. I don't expect tea or coffee, neither. I've got better things to do with my pension. We just wanted to talk yeah, I said, are you watching neighbours? going on around here, and I don't like it. Right, that's it. That's done. No more rubbish. Um, we were hoping to talk to you about the late Mary Fortune. Mary Fortune. Trollop. Tart. But I 
thought Mary took you for trips in the countryside. Oh, well, she did once. But the second time she come round here and I said I wanted to go to Bristol to look at the ships, didn't I, Boggle? Yes. She said it were too far and I said, didn't I, Boggle, that it was her duty to help the old get about? Not all of us had money to go gallivanting about in large cars. And what did Mary say to that? <laughs> that painted hussy had the cheek to say we should be in an old folk's home. I mean, did you ever hear the like? So I told her to get out and take her trollopy ways with her. Yes, you told her. You certainly told her. Is there any chance of opening the window? I'm boiling in here. It's like being in a greenhouse. No, you can't open a window. I'm not going to freeze to death for the likes of you. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Next thing I know, all our garden gnomes have had their heads chopped off. And there's no doubt in my mind who did the chopping. Well, that seems very strange behaviour for a middle-aged woman. Oh, you would take her side now, wouldn't you? I think it was disgraceful the way you two carried on. I mean, in my day, we got married before there was any of that. Right. Um, thank you for your help. <laughs> but it suddenly got much too hot in here. Well, when are you going to take us out again, Mrs. Reason? We had a lovely trip last time. Right. Uh, sorry, my car's out of service. Oh, can you get it fixed? No. The only mechanic who was qualified has moved to Kuala Lumpur. So afraid not. Oh, dear. Come on, James. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> hey, hang on. Why don't you take it? Life is far too short to be nice to old people. Really, Agatha? Now, about Mary. Oh, uh, yes. And Mrs. Boggle started talking about you two. I thought I was going to have to hose you down. Well, she was just a friend, but one night she did invite me back to her conservatory. I see. And did you exchange seedlings? It was a moment of midsummer madness. Sorry. I don't know why you're apologising. It's not as if I'm jealous or anything. Oh, good. Oh, excellent. Well done. Right. Well, I think we should visit Bernard's spot. The Boggles had their gnomes decapitated. He had his fish poisoned. There has to be a link. It's going to be a bit tricky to pull that one off. I mean, D.C. Wong is rather expecting us to go home and keep our noses clean. We don't have to tell him. Yes, but but if Bernard is being besieged by the massed ranks of Fleet Street's grubbiest, what happens if we get photographed on his doorstep? There's one surefire way to make sure you never get your picture in the papers. What's that, then? Join the Liberal Democrats? No. (laughs) Close your eyes. No picture editor will ever use a photo where the subject has their eyes shut. It looks terrible. Oh, so uh, we make our way there by Braille, then, do we? Exactly. Eyes shut and try not to step on the reptiles. Excuse me, are you any relation to Mr. Spot? No comment. Ow! Oh, terribly sorry. Was that your foot? Have you got the sun in your eyes, mate? I, I refer you to the answer my colleague gave earlier. Are you just scared of looking at the village of death? No, that's really unfair. It's not at all like that. If you lived here... Don't rise to the bait. He just wants a photo of you looking angry. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No comment, old chap. <laughs> Come in, Mrs. Raisin. Mr. Lacey, the rest of you can bugger off. Oh... How long will these siege conditions continue? Another couple of weeks, I'm afraid. This week, the tabloids will write about the village of death. Next week, all the posh papers will say how appalling the tabloids have been, and then they'll quote every salacious detail. Makes me ashamed to be British. And the police are no better. How will they ever find Mary's killer? They don't even know who killed my goldfish. Uh, Bernard, I I know this is going to sound strange, but there is a theory going round that, that Mary was responsible for the garden vandalism. Mary? Mary fought you? It's inconceivable. Well, why not? Mrs. Rayson, Mary was a wonderful, generous human being. And when I think of all that beauty extinguished in one barbaric act... Well, that may be the male point of view. Some people see her as a manipulative floozy who slept with anything in trousers. Get out. What? Get out of my house. Ooh, I was just making conversation. Well, may I suggest you offer your crackpot theories to the police? Well, I thought you said the police were no use. I'm prepared to be interviewed by the police. I consider it one of the more unpleasant duties of being a British subject. When it comes to the likes of you two, it seems like vulgar curiosity. Oh, Bernard, we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing it for Mary. Do you mind? I have a Boy Scouts jamboree to organise. Kindly leave me to get ready. Oh. Oh. 
Well, what do you expect from a geriatric scoutmaster? Agatha, have you ever considered a career as an international diplomat? With your skills as a peacemaker, the world will be plunged into Armageddon within seconds. Eyes closed, James. Don't let the reptiles see you. I mean, how did you work in PR so long without anybody hitting you? Usually I hit them first. Come on, you two. A joke's a joke. How about a nice picture? Oh, hey! Oh, dear. Was that your camera? I do hope it wasn't too expensive. There you go, Chivers. I know I've been ignoring you, and yes, I am trying to fob you off with food, but it is that rather nice turkey with a little bit of jelly in it. Is it all right if I stay for a bit? Oh, are we friends again? <laughs> Just I don't fancy running the gauntlet of the press anymore. It's been a rough few days. Yes, I'm feeling the strain too. Time for a cigarette. <laughs> oh, well, to your life you're smoking away. <sighs> Do you have to be so sanctimonious? The vat on my cigarettes pays for every hospital in Britain. Though I suppose you don't approve of dialysis machines, CAT scans, children's wards. Oh, don't answer it, James. That'll be a tabloid newspaper wanting us to pose with a terracotta pot and a length of rope. Oh, yes, some dreadful rag. Oh, probably the Guardian. You've reached the answer phone of Agatha Raisin. Please leave a message. Oh, um... A message for Mrs. Raisin. This is Mr. Wilmot here from Wilmot. Hello? Hello, Chivers. Yeah, yes, it is. You're a clever old cat, aren't you? Oh, yes. Who do you think murdered Mary Fortune? Well, what's that got to do with me? Was it strange old Bernard? Did she really? Nasty Mr. Boggles. Well, when can I come round? His evil wife. Right, I'll be there this afternoon. Or none of the above. I'll see you later. Bye. Who was that, then? Wrong number. <laughs> that was Mary's solicitors. Apparently, she's left me something in her will. Oh, you too. What? She left me something as well. I got the message this morning. Really? And when were you going to tell me? Well, to be honest, I found it a little difficult. I, I wasn't sure if you'd be jealous. Jealous? Me? Yes, you. I am old enough and ugly enough to accept that Mary had a thing for you. After all, you are her type. What does that mean? You wear trousers and you've got a pulse. Oh, I see. So that's why women queue up outside my door with homemade cakes. That's why I can't get my book written because of constant interruptions from the Carsley Lady Society. It's because I have a pulse, is it? Well, it gives you the edge over most of their husbands. Yes, I suppose men are a bit of an endangered species in the Cotswolds. At least I shall never want for a Victoria sponge. So let's go and see what your last fondant fancy left for you. And more to the point, what she's left me. Mm. Ah, there you are. Uh, take a seat, please, Mr Lacey, Mrs Raisin. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you will um, understand that I'm duty-bound to read the exact words that Mary used in her last will and testament. Yes. Certainly, yes. Although some of these words are calculated to wound. Far away. I've probably heard worse. Very well. Uh, uh, to Mrs Agatha Raisin of 10 Lilac Lane, Carsley, Gloucestershire, I leave the sum of £5,000. This is to pay for a tummy tuck and a much-needed course of Botox. Now oh, I'm being bitched from beyond the grave, am I? Uh, would you like me to continue? Yes, please do, by all means. To James Lacey of 8 Lilac Lane, I leave £5,000 for services rendered, although these services were not really worth that much. You had a wonderful sense of humour, Mary. <laughs> and that is the sum total of your bequests. When will the money come through? Well, it is, of course, subject to a police investigation, but dependent on the outcome, I should be able to extract the grant of probate and convert your legacies within this fiscal cycle. Before you become a solicitor, do you need a degree in gobbledygook? Mrs Raisin, you will have your money all in good time. Of course, I was forgetting. There are a hundred days in a solicitor's month. <laughs> right, James, I'll see you back in the car. Um, please don't be offended by Mrs Raisin and... and... Thank you for reading it all with such a straight face. Well, 
it sounds as if it was more than just one night of midsummer madness. It's not illegal. Of course not. I just thought you had better taste. Are you going to accept your money? May as well. It'll pay for my ridiculous garden, and I only bought that to keep up with her. Well... Where do we go from here? Left at the light, straight past Mr. Wu's heavenly pagoda, and then we're in the village. No, I mean with the murder investigation. Oh. Whoever killed Mary must have had incredible strength. Which rules out 99% of the village. We really aren't getting anywhere, are we? Well, do you have any bright ideas? No, I mean the traffic. We're gridlocked. Oh, yes, it's, it's the Boy Scouts Jamboree. You remember... Bernard spots little extravaganza. So what's all that scaffolding on the village green? Let's get out and have a look. Come on, boys. Hoist yourselves up. Just your forearms. Don't use your whole body. Just the forearm. Do you know, I really feel short should be illegal for anyone over 50. Well, he's managed to shake the press off. The press wouldn't want to come here. They don't want happy pictures of people getting on with their lives. They want empty streets, tearful faces, the village of death. As opposed to our very strange rural customs. Yes, what exactly are they doing on that haystack? It's some kind of mountain rescue display. They're picking each other up with ropes and pulleys. Very useful. Once they've learned to do that, they can break into upstairs windows. Oh, don't be such a killjoy. It's amazing how much weight one Boy Scout can carry. What did Archimedes say? If I had a big enough lever, I could lift the world. Or if I had a rope and pulley system, I could pick up a heavy corpse. Well done, boys! Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The next display will be at five o'clock sharp. Should we go to the police? Not yet. Let's pop round to Bernard's garden. Agatha, you know that feeling you have when you absolutely know something is the right thing to do? Yes. Well, I'm definitely not having that now. In fact, I'm feeling quite the opposite. If you don't want to help, you can go home. I'm sure you've got a crossword puzzle to solve. Good idea. Now, the only thing in my life that still makes some kind of sense. Go on, then. No, I couldn't go home. I'm not having your death on my conscience. I am perfectly safe. Bernard is half a mile away teaching Boy Scouts how to be cat burglars. Well, what are we looking for? I don't know. Rope, weed killer, sharp implements. Good grief, Agatha. You could arrest all of Carsley for possession of those. And please don't disturb the fish. Looks as though he's got some new ones. Aren't they the most boring pets in the world? Do you like goldfish? Actually, I do. Although I prefer koi, which is what these are. Do you have to be so pernickety? The correct word is pedantic. Give me strength. James, what are those? Oh, by the pond? They're tiny little headstones, look. Must be some sort of pet cemetery. In loving memory of Judith Victoria, who was taken far too soon. Must have been a cat or a dog or something. I'm going in the shed. Agatha, no, you really mustn't. I absolutely forbid you. And what fiendish item are you having to find in there? A trowel. I want to know what's buried here. Now, now this time you really are going too far. I, I, I insist that you stop. No, I demand, I demand it. Or you'll do what? Write a strongly worded letter to the Daily Telegraph? What are you going to say if Bernard comes back? I don't know. Good evening, Bernard. When he sees the way you've poked about in his garden, he'll be seething. Middle-aged scoutmasters do not seethe. They quietly stew inside their shorts. If Bernard comes back, I'll improvise. I always get away with it. I know you do. That's because you always have people around to help pick up the pieces. I think I've reached something. Agatha, it's going to be a Jack Russell or a cat. No, it isn't. It's smaller, about the size of a fish. In my opinion, anyone who builds a graveyard for fish is not quite the full shilling. That's a bit of a sweeping statement. Right, open the box. It is a fish. To a normal person, it's a fish. To Bernard, it's dearly beloved Judith Victoria. What are you doing with Judith Victoria? Why have you desecrated her grave? Bernard, thank goodness we found you. We just wanted to warn you that the police are on to you. They tested the rope that hanged Mary and they've traced it back to you. They couldn't have done. It was the scout's rope. Oh, dear. I think oh. you've just given yourself away, old chap. The world's better off without that woman and her sneering and her lies. She led me on, you know. She told me to come and see her. In her conservatory. You weren't the first man to visit her conservatory. <clears throat> we used to spend many happy evenings there, discussing leaf mould and pest control. And then she told me that she'd broken up with her lover. 
He'd had an operation, so he was no use to her. And she asked me where she was going to get another man in this village. And I told her to look no further. And did she take you up on the offer? She just laughed at me. She said I was a sad old man who wasn't in her league. You did have quite a vicious streak. So do I, Mr. Lacey. I told her it was far too hot in there and she'd better watch out or her face would melt. How did she take that? She just giggled. Didn't seem to mind. But that night, she crept into my garden, poured weed killer all over my beautiful, innocent fish. Now, now take your time, Bernard. Take your time. <laughs> she didn't know I'd seen her, but I did. A very light sleeper. So what did you do? I did nothing. I'm a gardener, Mrs. Raisin, and the one thing you need more than anything else is patience. Next time I saw her, she was friendly with me, as if nothing had happened. She carried on giving lectures to the Horticultural Society. I carried on exchanging cuttings with her, and eventually she started inviting me back to her conservatory. But how did you do the deed, Bernard? It wasn't rocket science. We sometimes enjoyed a glass of brandy of an evening. And I told her that when I was in the Navy, I could polish off a whole glass in one gulp. But I didn't think a woman would ever be able to manage that. Well, if there was one thing Mary liked, it was a challenge. Only, uh, it wasn't brandy, was it? Some of it was. The rest was weed killer. And she downed it in one. Surely she tasted it. She must have put up a fight. She struggled for a few minutes, but it wasn't hard to restrain her. Like holding down an inflatable doll. Bernard, it's a very good thing that you've told us this. And I think it would be better in the long term if you went and told the police now. Oh, the police. Thank you. Yes, I've got a lot to do before they get here. What are you talking about? Well, I'm just going to brush my hair. My photograph will be in all the newspapers. Typical. I couldn't get them to come to the Jamboree, but they'll be swarming all over my doorstep any minute now. James, what are we going to do? We wait here till he comes back. Are you mad? He could have gone to get a gun. And there's nothing more likely to make him pull the trigger than the sight of us running down the garden path. I'm phoning the police. Uh, We're quite safe. He's in the kitchen, combing his hair. Bill, it's Agatha. In Bernard Spot's back garden. He's just confessed to the murder. He's gone inside. Right. What does he say? He says we're to get out of the garden immediately. Really? I'd rather stay here. I'm a bit concerned about old Bernard. James, what's got into you? I thought I was the headstrong one. He's just been pottering about in the kitchen. He had a glass of water, and then he disappeared. Are you sure it was a glass of water? Oh, Lord! Bernard! Bernard! Uh, James, can you do first aid? I was in the army for 30 years. Oh. Weed oh. killer. I should have guessed. Oh. There's not much I can do here, Agatha. Well, pick him up. Make him walk up and down. That only works in films, I'm afraid. And I don't think anything's going to work now. Oh, Roy, thanks for coming to stay. I still can't sleep without terrible dreams of dying scoutmasters. That's what friends are for, Aggie. And to build designer gardens for you. I never did get to the bottom of that. Why were all the labels on the wrong plants? I was publicly humiliated. Nothing to do with me, sweetie. I numbered them one to a hundred, left to right. I told Gary, just follow the path round. Never mind. Anyway, Bill Wong was furious with us. He claims they were already on to Bernard. But thanks to us, all they've got is another body. Uh, well, at least he won't do it again. I mean, he could have poisoned the entire Carsley Ladies Society. Anthrax in the angel cake. Roy, right, don't make jokes about it. It's not nice. I'm just trying to take your mind off things. That James Lacey seems a nice chap. Especially when he's got his shirt off. He is. He's a thoroughly decent human being, and in spite of that, I still get on with him. (laughs) Well, shall we pop round, then? Maybe we can have a look at his earlier scar. I'd rather not. The funny thing is, when he told me that he had a hernia, the only thought in my mind was, oh, good, now I'll be able to win the gardening competition. Uh, That's your gift, Aggie. You're always able to draw comfort from the suffering of others. But when I heard he'd had an affair with Mary, it really hurt. I don't know why. 
I mean, the man means absolutely nothing to me. Oh, dear. I sense a maudlin moment coming on. I'll just get some more gin. No, Roy, it's in the cupboard on the left. What? No, I said the left. Oh, I'm sorry, I get confused. Right, you don't know the difference between left and right. All right, you don't have to go on about it. You know I'm nine-tenths dyslexic. So that's why I was humiliated at the garden festival. When you told Gary to put the labels on left to right, you meant right to left. Honestly, Aggie, so you were humiliated. It's all you ever think about, self, self, self. Anyway, it doesn't matter now. I'm getting rid of it all. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to rip up every last plant and put down a patio. Oh, Aggie, you can't do that. You can't destroy my beautiful back-to-front garden. You can watch me. I've had it up to here with green things. From now on, I'm sticking with concrete. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Roy was played by David Holt, and Bernard Spot by Paul Brook. Liza Sadovy was Mrs. Bloxby, and Ben Crow was DC One. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. just had a letter from the National Ramblers League. Sorry, ah. Tosses. Ten things for all Ramblers groups to remember. One, always close the gate. <laughs> Two, never light fires on open farmland. Ah. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. OK, thank you, Kelvin. I've got something a little bit more interesting. That stuck-up little weasel at the library has finally got me the new Rights of Way map. And it's just as I thought. There is an ancient route straight through Sir Charles Whitaker's land. Yes. Oh. Deborah, yes. weren't you going to write to old Charlie Moneybags? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kelvin and uh, Jessica. Yes, I, I have written to Sir Charles and I have now had a reply. Really? And what do the old fascists say? He's um, invited me round for tea to discuss the matter. Oh, no. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh great, with a real life. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Your tea, Sir Charles, ah. and a selection of sandwiches. Thank you, Gustav. Don't worry, I'll pour, as you wish, sir. Now, Miss Camden. <laughs> Deborah, please. Well, Deborah, I must say I did enjoy your little letter, but there's one thing that slightly puzzles me. Oh, yes? Why are you quite so keen to walk through the Barfield estate? Uh, that will be all, Gustav. Very good, sir. Well, um, it's our democratic right, you see. They've just published the conclusive map and the right of way goes straight through your land. Ah, well, let me have a look. <sighs> ah, yes, I notice it also goes through the council estate. And are you writing to them to ask if you can march through their gardens? Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't think so. Not <laughs> quite. No. Well, you seem a charming young lady, and I'm very happy for your merry little band to walk through my estate. But there is one condition. Oh, right. <laughs> so, Deborah, how was your tea party with the enemy? Hey, did he threaten to set the dogs on you? <laughs> I mean, no, he, he was quite nice, really. Nice? We're talking a bloated parasite who lives on 200 acres of land stolen from our ancestors. Well, he said we can go through it. There is one <laughs> little field we have to go round. He's um, growing rapeseed, so he's diverted the path round He it. can't do that. It's a public right-of-way. He's not allowed to obstruct but it. But he did say we could walk round it. Oh, he's tugging our forelocks as we go. Not only is he a parasite, the man is breaking the law. Jessica, I thought you were an anarchist. That isn't relevant. Well, if he wants to put barriers in our way, then it's up to us to smash them down. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 5. The Walkers of Dembley. Come on, Chip. Oh. oh. Oh, Mr. 
Mrs. Bloxby, come in. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Raisin. Uh, have you been back long? We flew in last night, so I thought I'd just pop by with some of our holiday snaps from Fuengirola. Oh, oh and a Battenberg cake. You really shouldn't have. Uh, let me take the cake from you and, and, and do sit down. Th- thank you. Is anything the matter? Bit of a domestic emergency, I'm afraid. Chivers has climbed onto that antique tall boy and has no idea how to get down again. I think she has difficulty reversing. Oh, the poor thing. They never quite lose that panther-like urge to climb, do they? No, but when she gets to the top, she suddenly turns into a scaredy cat. Oh, come on, Chivers. Come on. Oh, poor Chivers, don't be scared. It's not that far. I'm just going to get a stool. Oh, good idea. I don't think she's going to jump without a parachute. (laughs) Right. Here we go. Oh! Oh, Oh, Mrs. Raisin, are you all right? I'm fine. The stool is ruined, though. And you managed to make your own way down. Oh, well done. Let me help you with that. Ouch. Ooh. Oh. I'm astonished it wouldn't take my weight. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll put the kettle on and slice the batten back. Mrs. Bloxby? Yes, dear? Do you think I'm putting on weight? I can't say I've really noticed. Since moving to this village, I've given up work, stress and activity, and I've discovered cake, soft furnishings and daytime television. You should join the Carsley Walkers Society. Oh, not another society. No, no, honestly, this will be much better than the line dancing. It's only been going a couple of months. James Lacey runs it. James Lacey? He never said anything to me. Well, he did put a leaflet through everyone's letterbox. Oh, I see. Uh, those things go straight in the bin. It's really rather good. He's always pointing out fascinating bits of village history. Things Alf and I never knew in spite of all our years here. <laughs> All right, I'll give it a try. It's either that or the Carsley Porkers Society. (laughs) Where can I buy some Wellingtons? And over the brow of the hill. Now, the road we just crossed was Waynebody Road. Anybody know what Waynebody means? Um, uh, Yes, Mrs Bloxby. Is it Wayne as in to wane or fade away? Not quite. This Wayne is Old English for wagon, and Waynebody is where wagons full of bodies were driven to... uh, Jubilee Hill. It goes to Chibbit Hill. Exactly. Well done, uh, Mrs. Raisin. Throughout the 17th century, wagons full of bodies, uh, the enemies of the crown, were taken to Gibbet Hill, where they were hung from gallows, or gibbets, as an example to the others. I can think of one or two people they should do that to these days. (laughs) I'm sure you can, Mrs. Boggle. Now, Gibbet Hill is part of the Barfield estate, so it's probably best we walk round it. Is everybody fit? Yes. Don't look at us. It's you young'uns always straggling behind. (laughs) Well then, Mr. Boggle, let's head for the hill. Shall we have a sing-song? Lord, do we have to? Well, I I always think it makes the going a bit easier. (laughs) All together now. One man went to to mow. Went went to mow a meadow. One man and his dog. (laughs) Woof, woof. Went to mow a meadow. Two men went to mow, went to mow a meadow. Two men, one man and his dog. Wolf, hey. oh, stop! Oh, my legs! For heaven's sake, you're killing me! Me heart, me heart, take me home before I die. Hey, can we stop a minute, please, everybody? You got no respect for your elders tearing off like that. Uh, Mr. Bogle, would you like me to take you and your wife home? My car's just down the hill. No, no. Just take us back to the pub. We just need a glass of water. We'll be all right there. All right. I'll catch up with everyone later. Bye. Bye. Oh, dear. Was it my singing, do you think? Oh, Mrs. Bloxby, she's a martyr to the boggles. Uh, hang on a minute, please. Uh, do you need to catch your breath as well? No, I just need a cigarette. Honestly, Agatha, as a penalty, you can lead the sing-song. Are we all fit? Yeah. Yeah. One man went to mow, oh, went to mow a meadow, one man and his dog. Wolf, wolf, hey, went, went to mow a meadow, two men went to mow. Oh. Oh. Don't, don't, don't worry, everybody. Just a spot of clay pigeon shooting. It came from Gibbet Hill. It's nothing untoward, Agatha. This is a countryside. People do shoot things. Including other people from time to time. Uh, give me your binoculars. Ah. Yes. Can you remove the strap from my neck before you grab them? Looks like a diplomatic incident between a farmer and some rather scruffy ramblers. Let me have a look. Ah, ah, they were warning shots. Oh, Farmer Giles seems to be throwing his weight around all the... Uh, 
18 stone of it. They're probably having an illegal rave on his land. Nothing like an open mind, is there, Agatha? I'll just pop down and see if I can help smooth things out a little. You're not going on your own. Yes, I am. I think this calls for diplomacy and tact. I can do tactful. I just prefer to do worthless. Agatha, why don't you stay here and make a daisy chain? You cheeky devil. Right, everyone, I'm off to see what's going on down there. I'll I'll be back in ten minutes. If they don't use you for target practice. Hello, everybody. What were those gunshots? A little fracas between some ramblers and a farmer. Captain Mannering Lacey has gone to investigate. Oh, that'll be the other ramblers group, the Walkers of Dembley. Dembley? It's the next village along. We don't really have much to do with them. You're not going no further. Take your hands off me. Jessica, please, don't provoke me. I can handle this. Good morning. What seems to be the trouble? Oh, look who it is, Lord of the Manor. Uh, Uh, Actually, my name's James Lacey, a rambler just like you. Another waste of space, then. (laughs) You people got no right to be here. This is Sir Charles's land. We have every right to be here, and it's one of the few democratic rights that haven't been snatched away by the power elite that run this country. You tell him, Jessica. Don't you lecture me, young lady. I don't take orders from workshop layabouts. I am not a layabout. I happen to be deputy head of Dembley School. Well, I feel sorry for them kids, then. All this bickering isn't really helping. Is there a particular reason why these people can't walk through your field? Uh, Are you blind? It's full of oilseed rape. Uh, I'm not having this lot ruining my crop. Well, th- there is a path round the edge. Oh, but I suppose our working class feet aren't good enough for your yes. path. You're not getting in and that's fine. Oh, Jessica, couldn't we just walk around? Oh, I am what? not letting this capitalist lapdog tell me what to do. Aye. If you won't open the gate, I'm climbing over it. Aye. Don't yes. you dare. No, oh, no, 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 look here. Well, I respect your right to protect your crop. We don't live in the Wild West, and firing a warning shot is strictly illegal. Ah, you tell him, pal. And I don't think the chief constable would renew your license if he knew what you'd just done. Don't you threaten me. I am not threatening you. I am pointing out the facts. And I very much hope you will let these people pass through your field and that they will respect you by keeping it tidy. Well, they know what to expect if they don't. Looks as though Action Man Lacey has saved the day. Oh, good. Oh. What's the matter? You appear to be turning into a beetroot. Oh, I really don't like rapeseed. It always makes me sneeze. I mean, it's lovely and gaudy to look at because a touch of Las Vegas to the gods. Oh, but I, I do wish I brought my antihistamines. Well, they oh. call the truth. Oh. He won't shoot them, and they won't trample on his crop. Oh. And you haven't got any bullet holes in you. <laughs> Thank heavens. Now, how about that quiet walk in the countryside? <laughs> One man went to mow, went to mow a meadow. One man and his own to mow a Sir Charles, I... I'm so sorry about what happened. I, I tried to tell everyone to go round the field, but they insisted Deborah, that we should... it's not your oh. fault. I'm appalled. I thought my estate manager was high-handed, cavalier, and downright boorish. Well, we weren't exactly angels. At least you didn't wave a gun about. He must have taken leave of his senses. Yes, sir. It was rather frightening. I tore a few strips off him, I can tell you. He threw down his tools and walked off in a half. I think we all got a bit overheated. The thing is, you have such a beautiful place. Oh. And everyone was just so overwhelmed by it all that when we actually... Sir Charles, and a selection of pretty four. Oh, thank you, Gustav. Oh. Put them down there. Ah. So, anyhow, I just wanted to say I'm sorry and it won't happen again. Please don't mention it. Oh. Right. Milk and two sugars, wasn't it? Oh, you've got a good memory, Sir Charles. Just call me Charles, please. Who is it now? Ah, hello, Agatha. James, are you busy? Uh, not especially. Um, come in. Coffee? No, thanks. I just have one. Uh, what are you up to at the moment? Actually, I'm uh, still wrestling with the first chapter of my book. The first chapter? Is that the same first chapter you were wrestling with six months ago? Has it really been that long? Well, the Peninsula War did last six years, and I'm beginning to think the book will take about twice that. Maybe it's time you waved a white flag and surrendered. Never. Any minute now, inspiration will strike. 
Though I do realise I've been saying that for six months. <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you. Are you after anything in particular, or is it just a social call? I wanted to talk about the Walker Society. Oh, yes. The one thing in my life that's an unqualified success. Yes. Well, I was looking at possible ways to improve it. I mean, would you like some help with the organisation? What organisation? We put on our boots and we walk. That's just it. Would you like me to organise a proper membership structure, a newsletter, an annual subscription fee? A fee? What will we do with the money? You could buy a computer. I have a computer. What do you think I write my book on? Wax tablets? You need a dedicated computer for the group. Why? To store your membership database on. Agatha, I fear this conversation is a long walk leading nowhere. I was only offering to help. I appreciate that, but you must understand that not everybody needs your help. Sometimes the world turns very nicely by itself, and you've got to learn to sit back, relax, and smell the roses. Fine. I'll leave you to your book. And when social services find you slumped over the first paragraph in a year's time, I'll say, poor man, but at least he took time to smell the roses. Sir so Charles thinks that parasites like him own this country and we should be grateful for the crumbs from his table. Exactly. Well, I propose that next Saturday we break into his estate and destroy his precious that, rapes. That, that, that's criminal. Well, then it you serves him right for setting his estate manager on us and stopping us walking through his fields. Oh, hang on, Jessica. He did let us walk through yes. his fields. Only because a man with a gun was marching beside us. But, Jessica, I've got a letter from Sir Charles here. He says we can visit any time so long as we make an appointment. Oh, we shouldn't oh, need oh, to oh. make appointments. It's our right. Let me see that letter. Give it back, Jesse. You've got his phone number. But it's nothing to do You've with you. You've actually got the old fascist phone number. But he's much nicer than you'd expect. He, he's really not like the other... Well, people. since none of you have the courage of your convictions, I shall walk across Gibbet Hill on my own. You lot can stay here. It'll soon be time for bingo. Oh, Jessica, please don't go. Please don't spoil things. Debbie. Why are you standing up for this man? That weekend at the teaching conference, have you forgotten all the things we said and all the things we did? What happened in Scarborough was a mistake. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <sighs> Fine. I'm off to Barfield House. And I'm repaired this time. I've got wire cutters. Oh, Jessica, no. You have reached the office of Sir Charles Whittaker. If you wish to leave a message, please do so after the tone. I've got a message for you, Charlie boy. This is the sound of your fence being cut. And this is the sound of your crop being destroyed. And this is a wake-up call for people like you. People who hide behind their wealth who send out slaves to do their dirty work. Your days are numbered. Oh! Oh! What do you want? Get off me! Oh, get off! Get... Oh! There you are, Chivers. Half a tub of cottage cheese. No, I didn't fancy it much either. Hold on. Can I come in? I suppose so. What are you up to? Teaching my cat to like health food. I'm hoping she can finish off my diet for me. Well, have you read the local paper? No. I haven't been to the news agents yet. I've been in the garden smelling the roses. Now, now stop it, Agatha. This is important. Remember those ramblers who had that little rumpus with the landowner last month? Oh, yes, the Socialist Walkers Party. One of them's been murdered. Let me see that. Police are investigating the death of Miss Jessica Keller, whose body was found on the estate of Sir Charles Whittaker. Miss Keller, 35, was involved in a long-running dispute with Sir Charles over rights of way, and it is believed that at the time of her death she was trespassing on his land. Do you get the impression the editor wants us to think it was Sir Charles? Well, it is rather a good story. Evil landowner wreaks his revenge on Bolshe activists. Oh, look, she was bludgeoned to death with a spade. Very Edgar Allan Poe. What thing, though? According to the article, she had a degree in classics from Cambridge, but she was a teacher at Dembley Primary School. That's not surprising. An awful lot of intellectuals get a job at the village school. They can throw their weight around more if they're with people less qualified than they are. Yes, I know the sort. 
They're holding a memorial service at the school today. Must be a shock for the children. I think at that age they don't really know what death is. Well, they do now. I suppose D.C. Wong will be there, talking to all the teachers, hoping for some little nugget to fall into his lap. Oh, Constable, it's all been such a shock. Take your time now, Miss Candace. Well, last week she helped me take a class and she got all the kids to cut little men out of newspaper. Today I can't bear to look at a newspaper. (laughs) Would you like us to have a short break? No. No, it's all right. I'd rather get it over with. You must have been very close to Miss Keller. No. Yes. I mean... We were colleagues and, and both in the walking group, but we, we weren't especially close. And were you aware that she was trying to break into the Barfield estate? She told a few of us at the pub, but we didn't know if she was being serious or not. Did you make any attempt to stop her? Oh, we all tried. But Jessica was a very headstrong person. I keep thinking I should have tried harder. And that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Agatha, we really should install a connecting door between our houses. We seem to be popping in and out all day. I've got something rather interesting. Hold on, just a moment. Right, what is it? An invitation to Barfield House. What? Old Sir Charles's place? The very same. Why has he invited you? There's no need to look quite so gobsmacked. I assume he's heard of my detective skills. I suppose he reads the papers like everyone else. Sir Charles is keen to clear up this murder as soon as possible, and I've been invited to tea so that we can discuss it. Oh, murder and crumpets, eh? Would you like to come? What? With you? Yes, James, with me. If you went on your own, it would be gate-crashing. Well, I would like to see the old place on the inside. Well, that's settled. Let's go and get changed. Uh, Agatha? Yes? I'm rather surprised you're inviting me. I did rather pour cold water over your ideas for the rambling society. Forgive and forget. And uh, there is one other reason. Oh, yes? I've never much cared for stately homes. I keep thinking a well-built butler is going to pearl me down the ancient stone stairs. Oh, no, no, they wouldn't do that. They're very well trained, and that's definitely not de rigueur. Well, (laughs) I'm worried that they'll see I'm not one of them. They'll work out where I come from. Agatha, what are you talking about? Where do you come from? Birmingham. Well, I must say, you've totally lost your accent. I know, it's hardly surprising, really. (laughs) That sounds rather attractive, actually. When did you leave? As soon as I could afford the bus fare. Well, there are worse places you could have come from. Well, I'm hard-pressed to think of any of her. Thank you, James. (laughs) But Charles will see what the rest of the world sees. An extremely irritating, but um, rather marvellous woman. (laughs) Thank you, James. Well, I'll phone him up and tell him it's crumpets for three. Ah, good afternoon. Uh, My name is Colonel... If you would be so kind as to use the tradesman's entrance, it's at the rear of the house. Actually, we're invited to tea. Mrs Raisin and Colonel Lacey. I will see if Sir Charles is available... I think the butler did it. Unfortunately, we do need to look at the evidence. When I ran my PR company, we didn't bother with evidence. We had instinct. We turned edible underwear into a worldwide bestseller. And you don't do that by looking at the evidence. Butler's taking his time. He's probably gone to set the dogs on us. (laughs) I told you he'd see straight through me. Now stop the Pygmalion Act. I think he's in the hall. Let's listen. They are just outside. A gentleman and, for want of a better word, a lady. I don't know if they're journalists or photographers or just trying their luck. Gustav, what are their names? A Mrs. Sultana or some such. Good God, man, I invited the woman. Now, my dear Mrs. Raisin, we meet at last, and you must be Colonel Lacey. How do you do? I'm very well, all things considered. Uh, Do, come in, please. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) Now, if you'd like to come through to the drawing room. Gustav, some tea and scones for our guests, please. Very good, sir. I must apologize.
apologize profusely for Gustav. We have been somewhat plagued by what I believe are called paparazzi. One or two of them have tried to inveigle their way into the house. Well, then I can understand why he's on end. No, in any case, he does see it as his duty to frighten off the outside world. Really? A Rottweiler would be cheaper and better looking. Mm. <laughs> well, shall we sit by the window? Gives us a clear view towards Gibbet Hill. Thank you. Yeah. Before we go any further, I'd like to know why you invited me. Because you're the famous Agatha Raisin. Am I? Uh, and when did I become famous? When you spend as much time as I do on the internet, looking at local news and gossip, you notice some names crop up more than others. Agatha is rapidly becoming a village institution, mm. solving murders and uh, cheating her way to victory in competitions. <laughs> well, I find myself in need of your services, Mrs Raisin. As you know, there was a murder on my land last weekend. I was in London and have several witnesses, all of whom have been interviewed by the police. Good. I can check that out with my police sources. No, you don't do things by halves, do you? Anyway, I know I didn't do it, and the police know I didn't, but there will always be a suspicion that it was my staff possibly acting on my orders. Well, the papers do seem to be hinting at that. Indeed. So... I would like to employ you both as private detectives. Oh. Your job will be to clear my name. I thought our job would be to find out the truth. Uh, you will find the two things aren't mutually exclusive. I'd like to take some photographs of the field where the murder took place. Uh, well, the police have cordoned it off for the moment. They put up a huge tent. It looks as if the circus has come to town. Have they found the murder weapon? Yes, it was a shovel belonging to my estate manager, oh. but any fingerprints were washed off in the rain. How did the killer get hold of it? Two weeks ago, my estate manager had um, a bit of an altercation with some ramblers. Oh. He became extremely uh. abusive, and when I went out to reprimand uh. him later, he threw down his shovel and stormed off. Mr Charles, uh. I was involved in that little skirmish. I, I tried to make peace between the ramblers and your estate manager. Oh, good heavens, was yes. that you? Yes, yes. Oh, Deborah told me about that. Oh, this is good news. <laughs> this is very good news. Go on, Mr Charles. Ah. Thank you, Gustav. Anyway... I'm keen to know more about the woman who was killed. And by the looks of things, you've already won the trust of some of her friends. I hardly said a word to them. No, but they think you're on their side. Now, here's my plan. I have a flat in Dembley, little Pierre de Terre, and I propose that the two of you move in for a few days and try to get to know the walkers a little better. Uh, <laughs> won't we look a bit like undercover police officers moving in just after the murder? Oh, mm. you'll have to spin a yarn about why you're there. I think you should pretend to be a married couple. Uh, maybe on holiday? <laughs> uh, let's say it's your golden wedding anniversary. I don't think we've quite reached gold yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, silver, I mean. Uh, do you think you could pull that off? Well, I really don't know. I am... Um... I've never been married before. <laughs> you won't have to do anything beyond the call of duty, old boy. <laughs> uh, have I whetted your appetites? Well, it's close enough to home. At least I can pop back and feed the cat. Uh, I can do with a bit of a break from the Peninsular War. And did you say something about money? Yeah, I'll go and get my checkbook. Well, this is a turn-up for the books. Our first paid murder investigation. Are you excited? No, oh, I just take it in my stride. A brand new murder and a brand new marriage. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs Bloxby was played by Liza Sadaby and DC Wong by Ben Crow. With Rachel Atkins as Deborah, David Holt as Mr. Boggle, Philip Fox as Sir Charles, Alice Hart as Jessica, and Bertie Carvel as Kelvin. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatized for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 6 A Marriage of Convenience. Right, I've just unpacked the mugs. We need tea bags, milk, uh, anything else? Agatha, 
This is never going to work. What do you mean? People are never going to believe we're a married couple. Why shouldn't they? Well, I just don't feel very married. It isn't a medical condition. I'm totally new to this sort of game. I mean, I mean do I call you darling? Only if we're living in a 1950s sitcom. Now, here's your ring. You get a full refund if you take it back within 28 days. <laughs> well, that's longer than most marriages these days, I suppose. Uh, uh, James, not on that finger. Unless you're on a business trip and you've told your secretary the divorce has come through. <laughs> Well, at least this flat is a decent size. I, I, I'm so glad we don't have to share a bedroom. <laughs> mm, yes. So am I. Now, uh, let's get down to the pub and mingle with the murder suspects. So anyhow, we go over the Force Way and down into Baggett's Green. Oh, that seems a really good route, Kelvin. Uh, excuse me. Can I help you? Where do I find out about the Dembley Walking Society? Oh, this is it, but we're not walking this week, I'm... We've had a death in the group. Yes, uh, my, my wife and I read about that in our local paper. Uh, uh, didn't we, darling? If you say so, dear. Hang on. <clears throat> I know you. You're that man we met at, at Gibbet Hill. Oh, that's right. Oh, you cut Sir Charles's estate manager down to size, didn't you? Oh, yes, I remember you now. I, I'm James Lacey. Uh, my wife and I have, have just moved to the area. Uh, this is my wife. Uh, Mrs. Lacey. Agatha. Uh, I'm Kelvin. And I'm Deborah. Goodness, it's a small world. Well, um, can I buy you good people a drink? That's very kind of you. Uh, I'll have a pint of badgers. I'll have a fizzy mineral water. And I'll have my usual. Oh, uh, what's that? You know perfectly well, dear. Gin and tonic. Oh, of course. I, I, I've got a memory like, um, what do you call those kitchen things with all the holes in them? A sieve. That's the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, pint of badgers. Carbonated water, gin, and it. A tonic. Right! <laughs> Mrs. Lacey, your husband's a scream. That's just what I was thinking. Scream. So, what made the Perriers move to Dembley? Quality of life, really. We're both keen walkers, both retired, and this is a very beautiful part of the country. Oh. Yes, we are lucky to live here. In spite of all the recent horror. Mm. It must have been a shock, losing... Uh, Jennifer, was it? Jessica. And yes, it was. I keep waiting for her to walk through the door, tell us to rise up and march through the wheat fields of our capitalist oppressors. Oh, is that the kind of thing she was likely to have said? <laughs> oh, Jessica had very strong views about that sort of thing. I didn't always agree with her, though, of course, she had every right to express her opinion. If you ask me, that was what did for her in the end. She was attacked by one of Sir Charles's lackeys. Oh, yes. She was found in his field, wasn't she? Though, what makes you think it was one of Sir Charles's people? Oh, just a hunch. Mind you, they'll never prove it. It's the old, old story. If you've got the money, you can get away with anything. Oh, do you think so? Most prisons these days seem to be social clubs for MPs and pop stars. Right, right, here we are. Uh, uh, badgers, fizzy water, G&T, and a scotch. Cheers, pal. Thank you. Your, uh, your wife was saying that you've retired. That's right. I was in the army for 30 years. Oh, you're a military man. Yes, but, but I gave it all up for love. The day I met Agatha. There's some things in life too precious to lose. <clears throat> and the day I cast my eyes on this, on this wonderful woman, I thought, forget your country, forget your job, forget your social status. All that matters is this lovely, sweet lady. Mr. Lacey, that's so beautiful. That's really, really beautiful. <laughs> well, that was the most convincing display of marital bliss since Liza Minnelli last staggered down the aisle. Oh, for heaven's sake, I was only acting. Well, you're a terrible actor. That's not what they said at the Army Benevolent Fund when I gave them my nanky poo in the Mikado. No wonder morale is so low in the armed forces. I need a cigarette. Agatha, this is Sir Charles's flat. Does he really want his wallpaper to be sepia-tinted? If you don't shut up, it'll be blood-spattered. Well, I think with that display of man's evolutionary origins. Anyway, what did you think of young Kelvin? He was giving you some very funny looks. I think he saw right through you. But does that mean he might be feeling a bit guilty? He might think someone's onto him? No, it just means he has a brain. Now, what about Deborah? Sweet little thing, yes. Rather charming, actually. I thought so. Men always go for women like that. Women like what? Little mousy ones who giggle inanely at their jokes. It makes a pleasant change. Now, 
Deborah was the mediator between the Ramblers and Sir Charles. She's been to Barfield House a couple of times, and she was friendly with Jessica. So, she was familiar with the murder victim and with the scene of the crime. Uh, well, who can that be? Nobody knows we're here. Probably the gas board selling us electricity. Or the electricity selling us gas. Afternoon, folks. Bill Wong, <laughs> how on earth did you manage to find us? It's my business to keep an eye on what's going on round here. You may think we spend all day putting up new speed cameras, but there's more of the job than that. Well, you'll have to get up early to keep an eye on Agatha. <laughs> I know, I'm thinking of having her electronically tagged. <laughs> I hear congratulations are in order. Are they? What have we done? Mr and Mrs Lacey? <gasps> oh, goodness me, sorry. No, no, can I just clarify? We're not really mad. It, it is just an act. There's no need to sound quite so defensive. Actually, I'm aware of that. And I'm also aware of who owns this flat and that you're trying to clear his name. Well, the thing is, we really don't think Sir Charles did it. And why is that, then? Because he's got such a nice face. We have our reasons. And I suppose you're here to say, be good, leave it to the police, go home and take up the karami. No, no, Mrs Raisin. It's Mrs Lacey, please. Mrs Lacey. You do all sorts of things we couldn't get away with. You go undercover, you tell lies, you generally stick your nose in... Now, obviously, we can't condone that, but I just want you to promise whatever you find, you give it to me first. Have I ever kept things from you in the past? Frequently. Now, where are you off to next? Well, I'm off to the library to look at back issues of the local newspaper, and I'd also like to have a look at the electoral roll, find out where our suspects live and their, and their nearest relatives. <sighs> I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Then I suppose our Agatha's going to pay them a visit? No, I want to talk to the neighbours first, get a clearer picture of who these ramblers are. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. People don't take kindly to strangers snooping on their doorsteps. I won't be snooping. I'll be carrying out market research. It's amazing what people reveal for a £5 gift voucher. Oh, dear me. She's got a clipboard and she's not afraid to use it. Hold on! I'm coming! I'm coming! Yes? Mr Witherspoon? That's right, and I don't care what you're selling, I ain't having it. I'm from the council's core service delivery unit, and I'm conducting a survey on whether people are happy in their neighbourhoods. Whether you feel safe, whether you like your environment, whether you get on with your neighbours. Neighbours, eh? I could tell you a tale or two about them if I had a mind. Well, there's a five-pound gift voucher if you can spare the time to help. Is there? Well... What I was going to say is worth five pounds of anyone's money. Come in, my ducks, before they see me talking to you. Oh. Sit yourself down. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> now, there are six questions I need to ask. How long have you been living here? I've well, been living here since they built the flats. Uh, 1960, um... Yeah, 1960 and we'll be fine. Mm. And uh, do you get on mm. with your neighbours? Well, not as well as what I used to. Here next door, she come from Zanzibar. Don't speak a word of English. I don't speak much Swahili, so there ain't much we can talk about. What about your neighbour across the hallway? Mm. No, that's another story, that is. <laughs> Did you read in the paper about that woman got murdered on Gibbet Hill? I think I might have. Well, that's her lover. What? <laughs> She's one of them homo sapiens. You mean homosexuals? There's the one. How do you know about this? I seen it with my own eyes, my dear. I seen things they don't even allow on Channel 4. Uh, Mr. Witherspoon, with respect, if they were lovers, I'm surprised they invited you in to watch. Oh, I seen it with a spy in my door, I did. The two of them kissing goodnight. Well, it started as a kiss, but then they got very excited. And that Jessica with her huge hand, she stuck her uh, down Thank you, of that's the... absolutely fascinating. I only wish I had a box to tick for it. Oh, the love that dare not speak its name, they used to call it. Oh, nowadays it's the love that will not shut up. I don't know what the world's come and do. I really don't. Mr. Lacey, here's the book you requested. Thank you so much. And just let me know if there's anything else you need. I, I will do. Thank you again. James, I've got something to tell you. Uh, darling, do pull up a chair and try to remember there are people reading. I'm 
just talking in a perfectly reasonable volume. Yes, yes, but your talking impinges on those people who have come here to improve their minds. James, you may see the library as a place of learning, but to me, it's where old people come to save on their heating bills. <laughs> you be quiet. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry about my wife. Uh, darling, uh, let's go to the periodical section. Well, have you found anything? Not a lot. I do have an address for Deborah's mother, but the local papers only go back six months. I did find some very cheap flights to Barcelona there. Bugger Barcelona. I have what I think we might describe as a bombshell. Well done, you. What is it? Deborah was having an affair with Jessica. What? Dear sweet little Deborah, she couldn't have. They don't all have shaven heads and look like bricklayers. Well, Jessica certainly did. Haven't you seen her picture in the Dembley Gazette? <laughs> there are lots of reasons why people sleep with each other. Sometimes it's looks... Sometimes personality, sometimes it's the bulge in their trousers caused by their wallet. Well, if it was a power thing, I, I suppose Jessica was a bit of a catch. Oxbridge-educated deputy head teacher. But there's a much bigger fish in the sea now, isn't there? What do you mean? Deborah's been to Barfield House at least three times, negotiating on behalf of the Ramblers. You don't think she's after Sir Charles, do you? If my theory is correct, sweet little Deborah is about to bait her hook and dangle it in the water. Deborah, it's so sweet of you to come and visit. Oh, I couldn't bear to think of you alone all weekend. Well, it can get quite terrifying, what with the howling wolves and the ghosts of my ancestors <laughs> rattling round in their chains. <laughs> You're always teasing me. <laughs> anyway, Gustave will be back on Sunday. You're really lucky to live in such a beautiful house. Beautiful, is it? Baedeker described it as architecturally undistinguished. Still, there will always be critics. I used to visit places like this when I was little, and all the interesting bits seemed to be fenced off with a rope. Those weren't the interesting bits. Those were the staff lavatories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to dream that one day the owner would come down, lift up the rope and say, you don't need to bother with that. Come with me and I'll show you all the hidden nooks and crannies. <laughs> we were open to the public once. I cannot tell you how soul-destroying it is to have herds of people trampling across one's childhood memories. I could have cheerfully picked up the rope and strangled them with it. I know. People can be ever so disrespectful of beautiful things. I'm fed up with beautiful things. I prefer beautiful people. Oh. So, are you here for the whole weekend, Deborah? I'm all yours, Charles. Well... Let's lift up the rope, and I'll show you my private area. Oh, dear. If the time's like this, I really wish I'd taken up watercolours instead. It's Deborah. I know it's Deborah. I can feel it in my gut. But how can you be so certain? I can't be. Which is why we're going to visit her mother. Oh, well, that'll clear it all up. Mrs. Camden, is your daughter a decent sort? Yes, dear, apart from her habit of bumping off ex-lovers. James, I know she'll try and protect her daughter, but something will slip. The police have probably interrogated her till she's blue in the face. But we are not interrogating her. We are two journalists writing a sympathetic piece on a local tragedy and all the people affected by it. And uh, which paper are we meant to work for? Uh, the Grave Robbers Gazette? All you have to do is nod your head and keep chewing your pencil. Fine. I know my place. And when Mrs. Camden attacks you with a steam iron, do I use the pencil to defend you? Here we are. Oh, Lord. Here we go. Over the top. Hello. Mrs. Camden? That's right, Pet. My name is Agatha Lacey. I'm the editor of Cotswold Life magazine, and this is my assistant, James. How do you do? Ah, you'll be wanting to talk about the wedding. What? Oh, I can hardly believe it. My Deborah and a real-life baronet. What? Y yes, it's, it's an absolute fairy tale, which is why my editor is quite lost for words. Uh, let's go inside, and, and you can tell us all about it. My Deborah, she always said she would make something of her life. When she were a kiddie, she said to me, Mum, I'm going to be a teacher. 
And she worked so hard for her exams. She had no help from her father, mind. He was no use to her. Right, right, I get the picture. A very well-motivated young person. Yes. So, when she says to me, Mum, I'm going to marry Sir Charles Whittaker and live at Barfield House. Oh, I was so happy for her. But they've only known each other a few weeks. Well... That's just the sort of person my Deborah is. If she wants something, nothing will stand in her way. Nothing, or, or indeed no one. Oh, it's going to be a dream wedding. Everyone will be there. Famous people from the television, maybe even the royal family. I imagine Lord Lucan will put in an appearance. Oh, and they're having a cake with little marzipan models of themselves, looking like Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Mrs Campbell. Yes, Pet. Does Sir Charles actually know that he's going to get married? Well, he, he hasn't got round to asking her yet, but you know what men are like. Yes, indeed. But she said to me, Mum, tonight I know it's going to happen. After all these years on the shelf, I finally found my handsome prince. Well, Deborah, um, that mm. was a wonderful... Wonderful evening. And I never want it to end. All good things must come to an end, oh. my dear. Mm. Let's celebrate a very special night. Where did that come from? I always keep a bottle by my bedside. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Here's to our future. Yes, to both our futures. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm going to go and run us a bubble bath. Oh, Deborah, you're spoiling me. When we get married, I want all of this wood panelling painted white. It's so gloomy in here. Uh, what did you say? I just think this panelling looks so dark. Never mind the panelling. What do you mean, get married? around waiting for you to pop the question. Deborah, we're having fun, that's all. I never said anything about marriage. I'm not the marrying guy. But you've got to marry me. Deborah, let's not argue. We've had a wonderful evening. Let's not spoil it. No. I wouldn't want anything in the world to spoil it. Do you have to drive so fast? I keep thinking we're going to crash into a sheep or something. What would a sheep be doing out at this time of night? I don't know. Sleepwalking. Come on. There's got to be a quicker route. Oh. James, put a cigarette in my mouth. What? It helps me to think. No, it doesn't. It clogs up your arteries and makes you irritable. No, James, you do that. <sighs> Just put it in my mouth. They're on the dashboard. Oh. Uh. Uh. There, there. Uh. Come on. Oh. Sorry, I... I've never been any good with these. You'll just have to wait. Oh, will you stop faffing about and gird here? <laughs> oh! 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 Are you all right? Not really. Are you happy now? Well, it's not my fault we're in a haystack. Only one way to get to Sir Charles now. What's that? Cross-country running. Oh! Oh! your bath warm enough, Charles? Uh, yes, yes, it's it's quite lovely. If it isn't, I could always go and get a kettle. No, no, it's quite all right. Oh. Uh, someone at the door. Oh, don't worry. They'll go away. No, I don't want them to go away. I, I, I mean, it, it could be important. Nothing is important except you and me and our future together. Oh, no, Deborah, I'm, I must get out of the bar. Okay, uh -huh. I'll let you. If you tell whoever's there... You're going to marry me. Deborah, you're absolutely crazy. Crazy, am I? Is that what you think of me? <laughs> it's no good. He's not going to answer. James, we have got to get into the house. I'm sure I heard shouting. In that case, this calls for action. Get out of my way, Aggie. Let's see if I can still pull off the old... Unarmed combat training. One, two, three. Ah! Oh. oh! Obviously not. What did you do oh. that for? Because I love the sound of my shoulder dislocating. Honestly. Let's try the tradesman's entrance. Oh. 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 O
Everyone take it easy. Oh. Tell me what's going on. Bill, thank goodness you're here. Deborah has something to say to you. Hello, Constable. It's like a party in here, but then I suppose we've got so much to celebrate. Uh, all right, Miss Camden. Let's come this way. Another cognac, Mrs. Rayson? No, it's all right. I've stopped shaking. I just need a cigarette. I'll, I'll have another snifter, if I may. Oh. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Hmm. Well, I really can't thank the pair of you enough. I mean, you saved my life. You really did. There is the small matter of our fee. No problem. And the damage to my car. Consider it paid for. And the farmer's fee. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. I wonder how Deborah's getting on. Do you think she'll ever stand trial? I shouldn't imagine so. She'll probably spend the next 20 years in a psychiatric hospital writing obscene poems about it. Oh, dear, I do feel wretched. I keep thinking it was my fault that somehow I led her on. Right, Fox. I thought I'd just inform you, Miss Camden has admitted everything. She oh, says she was in love with Sir Charles, but Jessica got in the way. <laughs> and I have a visitor for you, Mrs. Rayson. Oh, yes? If you'd like to follow me. Uh... Bill, I just want to say, whatever I've said about the police in the past, at least you were there when it mattered. Well, thereby hangs a tale. Oh, yes? We weren't actually after Deborah. No. We were after you for dangerous driving, hence the patrol cars from three counties. Typical. Absolutely typical. Oh, Mrs. Razor, I'm so glad to see you. We heard there'd been a crash, and I phoned Bill, and he and said... Mrs. Bloxby, that... I crashed into a haystack. The haystack came off worse. Oh, thank goodness. Well, I'll leave you ladies alone. I'll take your statement later, Mrs. Raisin. Thanks, Bill. I have to say, we've all been a bit worried about you, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, yes? We heard you'd moved into a flat with James Lacey. Well, I could think of scarier people one could move in with. So the rumours were true, Mrs. Bloxby. You must never listen to rumours. What were they saying? Well... Tongues have been wagging as to whether bells might soon be ringing. Oh, dear. I don't think we'll be booking the church hall just yet. James and I have been involved in a murder investigation. Oh, that's a pity. I'd almost persuaded Alf to buy me a hat. <laughs> so it was business rather than pleasure. I'm afraid so. Though there was the odd pleasurable moment. Well, Mr Lacey can be very good company. Yes, when he's not nagging me to give up smoking, whispering on about Napoleon or begging to go home. <laughs> you know, Mrs Bloxby, it's been quite a few years since I lived with someone and I thought it would be a complete nightmare. But uh, it wasn't entirely hell on earth. Oh, coming from you, Mrs Raisin, that's praise indeed. Yes. Given time... I think I could almost get used to it. Goodness. Perhaps I might still get that hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, you and Mrs. Raisin made a very handsome couple. Oh, yes, well, that was just character acting. Uh, we were both uh, playing a part. Oh, come <laughs> now, James. I did chemistry at school, and oh. you two certainly turned the litmus paper blue. Have you taken leave of your senses? I find the woman an irritant, huh? like a toothache one can never get rid of, like a Leylandi eye forever blocking one's view of the heavens. Oh, don't <laughs> try and pull the wool over my eyes. I really think you should go for it, old boy. I really think you should stay off the sauce. You're protesting far too much. Carpe donna, I say. Seize the lady. <laughs> Clearly, this cognac has hallucinogenic properties. I do not have the slightest wish to seize Agatha Raisin. <coughs> Cheers. Morning, Chivers. Have you been a good girl this week? Well, so have I. Despite what the Carsley Lady Society is saying. Still, what do you care? 
So long as I can still use a tin opener. There you go. You enjoy that. Oh, hang on, I'm coming. James. Good morning, Agatha. Come in. Hello, Trivers. You must be glad to see Agatha. Everything's back to normal now. Are you calling for anything in particular? You left these in my car. Two packets of cigarettes. Well, hey, well, that's breakfast taken care of. Have you ever tried giving up? I did once. It made me even more irritable. Is that possible? Don't start. <laughs> How's the book coming on? Very well. I've uh, finally made a breakthrough. Really? Yes. I, I've changed the name of the opening chapter from The Rumblings of War to Rumblings of the War. Bravo! You're in the home straight now. Well, it was fun pretending to be married to you. Now do we pretend to get a divorce? My imaginary solicitors will be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> James? Yes, Agatha? Why don't we go out for dinner? You know, to celebrate our divorce. An imaginary dinner? No, James, a real one. Well, that's a good idea. There's a new place just opened in Evesham called um, Serenissima. Oh, is it Italian? I believe so. Good. I'll pick you up at eight. I shall look forward to it. Well, um... Back to the Peninsula War, then. <laughs> Thanks for the cigarettes. You're welcome. Well, Chivers, a night of serenissima with James Lacey. Whatever next. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy and D.C. Wong by Ben Crow. With Rachel Atkins as Deborah, Philip Fox as Sir Charles, and Bertie Carvel as Kelvin. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. And that was the last in the current series of Agatha Raisin.